Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first wildfire symposium of a series by the University of California system. Before we begin, I would like for the audience to take a 60 second anonymous poll just to calibrate who we have. Beth. Okay, I think that's 60 seconds. Thank you, everyone. So as I mentioned, I'm Teresa Maldonado. I'm the system-wide vice president for research and innovation at the University of California. My role is to cultivate and advance excellence in research, research translation, demonstration projects, and commercialization, as well as to inspire innovation, creativity, and entrepreneurship among the rich diversity of scholars we have at the University of California. The UC system includes our 10 campuses, as well as three UC affiliated Department of Energy National Laboratories. Those are Lawrence Berkeley, Lawrence Livermore, and Los Alamos National Labs. It also includes the Agriculture and Natural Resources Division and UC Health. As we all know, 2020 was a record-breaking year for wildfires in California. We had 9,639 in total, which burned 4.4 million acres and damaged properties to the tune of $16 billion. The largest fire to date was the August complex, which occurred last August in 2020 and burned over 1 million acres. Of the top six largest fires in California, in terms of acreage burned, five occurred in 2020. The deadliest fire was the campfire in November of 2018, in which we lost 85 lives, and most of Paradise, California, a community was decimated. The most destructive fire, once again, was the campfire, which destroyed 18,804 structures and burned nearly 154,000 acres. Published research has shown that 84% of wildfires in the United States are caused by human ignition, and 97% excuse me, of those threaten homes. However, we know that climate change is absolutely having an impact with severe and anom anomalous weather patterns. Wildfires are not just a California issue. <laughs> In the United States, there have been an average of 67,000 fires annually over the past 10 years. In 2018, the year of the devastating campfire, nearly 22,000 fires burned more than 7 million acres across the West. And 63% of that land was on federal property. Thus, these fires are not just a state issue. Wildfires also affect vulnerable communities in California, especially hard, particularly low income communities and the elderly. We know fires are going to happen every year, but when and where, why, how big, what are the anticipated short-term and long-term impacts on our families, our people, our property, our communities, on our water supply and, and the quality of it, on our air quality, on our wildlife, on our food supply, and on our land? And what are the trends? Can we make predictions accurately, understand the complexity of these events, and develop informed strategies and solutions? 
The state of California has been aggressive in trying to develop strategies to address many aspects of wildfires, how to mitigate them, how to protect communities, how to manage forests, how to address policy, and so on. There have been many task forces formed, many studies done, and many reports issued. However, how do we integrate these efforts in a holistic way and not have them offer standalone findings? In January of this year, the state of California issued the report entitled California's Wildfire and Forest Resilience Action Plan. If followed, there is an opportunity to address fires holistically. The University of California system intends to do just that. Today is our first step as a university system. Today you will hear about the tiniest tip of the iceberg of the expertise, capabilities, and demonstrations the UC system has to offer to the public. UC has literally hundreds of researchers from literally all disciplines who work on different aspects of wildfires with great passion and purpose. Brought together, our hope is to make more substantive impacts on understanding this wicked problem, to offer research-informed strategies and solutions, to address the disproportionate impact on vulnerable populations and communities, and above all, to save lives. I will add too that we do not work alone. As you will begin to learn, our researchers have a rich network of collaborators and partnerships at other universities, in industry, nonprofits, and state and federal agencies. Finally, because of the complexity of wildfires, the UC system is hosting a series of these symposia. Therefore, gradually you will hear from other scholars who are eager to share their work in the hope that it can be helpful. Before we begin our formal agenda, I will provide guidelines in just a minute, but first I would like to hear from, President, uh, from Provost Dr. Michael Brown. As I said, he's the system-wide provost of the University of California system and executive vice president for academic affairs. Dr. Brown. Thank you, Vice President Maldonado, for that introduction. I'm pleased to be here today for the UC Office of Research and Innovation's first uh, wildfire research symposium. As Vice President Maldonado noted, this is the first in a series of symposia developed by UC's Office of Research and Innovation. The critical challenges facing California are complex and urgent. As we will hear further this morning, taking lives in our state and threatening the livelihoods of Californians and not just Californians uh, into the foreseeable future. It's all hands on deck. There are clear opportunities for each Californian to contribute to addressing these challenges and the university is no exception. This symposium and the work featured constitute a part of the way that the university actively positions itself to address the pressing needs facing California. The UC system stands eager to partner with and to serve as a scientific resource for the governor, the legislature, and all state agencies to develop scientifically sound policies and programs that can benefit Californians from all walks of life. One of my colleagues, uh, uh, the Merced Provost would say, we seek to be experts not on top, but experts on tap uh, for Californians. On behalf of President Michael Drake, and I thank you for engaging with us uh, through our Wildfire Research Symposium. And with that, I'll pass it back into the hands of Vice President Maldonado. Thank you so much, Provost Brown, and we're so happy you're here with us today. So before we begin with the formal agenda, let's uh, review some housekeeping um, guidelines since we're in a virtual format. First of all, the attendees will be muted during the presentations. However, you will be uh, able to ask questions using the Q&A function. Just start inserting questions as the speakers are speaking and uh, we will be monitoring those questions. Uh, 
If we do not get to your questions during the Q&A of a session, we will be capturing all of them and following up with each and every one of you after the event is over. The chat feature is disabled, so the Q&A function is the only way for you to provide those questions or comments. If you are experiencing technical difficulties, please email Beth Kelman at the email address shown or Zoom chat Beth Kelman directly. Closed captioning is available. You can enable from your own Zoom settings. And this meeting will be recorded. So thank you, Tisa. Now I would like to just quickly review the agenda. And as I mentioned, we're gonna have a series of these meetings. Uh, and so you will be hearing different themes in these symposia as we move forward. May I have the agenda for today, please? So today you will be hearing a keynote address on a demonstration project that's actually in place. It's not just demonstration, it's actually implemented on alert wildfire. We will then move to a panel to look at how we can use big data modeling and simulation tools to inform the complexity of wildfire ignition, monitoring and response. We'll take a five minute break that was by design so you don't get lost in your email. We'd love to have you back for the rest of the program. The break will be followed by two presentations. Uh, the first one is a wonderful holistic uh, view of wildfires and its impact on California and some strategies of how they're accelerating uh, technologies to be implemented for immediate use. We'll then move to looking at a resilient California with many fantastic ideas. And each of those presentations will have a Q&A part to them. We will conclude the meeting with a panel on drought impacts and expected wildfire behavior uh, comments. Now this theme is directly out of the state of California, January, 2021 report that I just referenced. And so you'll hear some remarks around that theme and then we will conclude. So again, you'll have opportunities to ask questions um, throughout the event. And our, we have a team who is going to do their best to try to capture them. And with that, I'd like to go to the keynote. I am very pleased to introduce Dr. Sandra Brown, who is the Vice Chancellor for Research at University of California, San Diego. She is also a distinguished professor of psychology and psychiatry. Sandy, please take it over. Thank you so much, uh, Vice President Maldonado, uh, for um, both uh, introducing me and most importantly, for uh, generating these opportunities to talk about this critical issue for the state of California and all of Western United States. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Neil Driscoll. He is a professor of geology and geophysics in the mm -hmm. Earth section at Scripps Institution of Oceanography here in San Diego. His training and experience at Columbia University, Woods Hole, and MIT have positioned him as an impactful scientist for now and the future. He researches tectonic deformation and the evolution of landscapes and seascapes. And his work primarily focuses on uh, the sediment record to understand processes that have shaped the earth and are shaping the earth today. Importantly, Dr. Driscoll is the co-director of UC San Diego Center for Public Preparedness, or CP2 as we like to refer to it, and Alert Wildfire. It's an early fire confirmation and situational awareness tool that we'll hear about today. It was built by uh, UC San Diego, the University of Nev uh, Nevada, Reno, and the University of Oregon. Alert Wildfire is a network of state-of-the-art pan, tilt, zoom, fire cameras, and associated tools to help firefighters and first responders confirm, to locate, uh, address fire ignition, to quickly scale fire resources up or down as needed, and to monitor the fire behavior through containment. 
Finally, it provides enhanced situational awareness to inform firefighters in their strategy and to aid in evacuations. The systems now become an essential tool with over 800 cameras located across the United States. I think this is a good example of how science works. We make investments in basic infrastructure that lead to important societal benefits in the long run. The inf infrastructure for this system was first developed as an earthquake monitoring tool, but it evolved into a multi-hazard system that continues to provide valuable monitoring during fires and other extreme weather events, including earthquakes. So we're pleased to have Dr. Driscoll start this information rich day on contributions uh, of the UC system to the state of California challenge for wildfires, consistent with that goal to assist in addressing the major challenges of the state and the nation, Alert Wildfire has a statewide rapid response program for these fire emergencies. And through his extensive collaboration with the San Diego Gas and Electric Utility Company and countless county and city partners across the state of California, Nevada, and Oregon, Neil has built an, a, this system uh, to in, in con that in conjunction with Wi-Fi speeds the modeling for the movement of fires. Importantly, his system has already had remarkable and extensive impact through the life, natural resource and facility savings for the state of California. And I am especially appreciative of the extra support that this system brings to underserved communities across the state. And I hope that Dr. Driscoll will share a little bit of that in his presentation. We'll look forward to your questions in the Q&A after his presentation. And with that, Dr. Driscoll, I turn the stage over to you. Thank you, Dr. Brown, for that great introduction. Um, thank you all for participating in this symposium. Uh, Dr. Maldonado, thank you for pulling this all together and starting this to highlight and showcase the strength of the University of California. So the system here, I'm gonna share my screen so I can uh, talk to you about Alert Wildfire. So here we go. So today I'm gonna talk to you about Alert Wildfire as has been pointed out um, and the benefits by Dr. Brown. I'm gonna talk about the science, the implementation and the impact of wild, wildfire technology. So as we talk today, we're under a sizzling heat wave. We're gonna have strong winds in the mountains region, 40 to 45 miles an hour. This is Lake Oroville or what's left of it. We're in extreme drought over here in the upper right. This is the Palisades fire that burnt just last month, thousand acres. Even though there were high humidity with the marine layer and um, the, the vegetation is just so dry that it ignites. So here in the West, we're faced with prolonged drought. These events, Santa Ana winds, Santiago Diablo winds, and, and here they dry out the vegetation. There's single digit humidity and anything will burn. Fire season is getting longer and stronger. So here, Alert Wildfire, together with CAL FIRE, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric, and Pacific Gas and Electric, have funded this network of high definition pan tilt zoom access cameras with near infrared fire detection. On a clear day, they can see 70 to 80 miles. At night with the near infrared, they can see over 100 miles. This microwave communications network, we've built ourselves. This is our network for increased resilience. And as Dr. Brown pointed out, there's other benefits that are realized from this system not just hazards, we're bringing high speed internet to remote communities, underserved communities, to firehouses that are in remote locations. This is critical for intelligence about fires and disasters, but it also is an incredible uh, moving the, the needle for education and getting high speed internet and resources into these remote schools. 
This network provides unparalleled ability to confirm 911 calls. So a 911 call comes in, we're able to move the cameras immediately, determine if there's ignition, and then scale our response. It also improves situational awareness of how the fire is progressing. And in the worst case scenarios, it can help sequence evacuations. So as Dr. Brown said, we have over 800. I think the number as of this morning when I checked is 842 cameras. And you'll notice the distribution of cameras is delineated by the high fire risk regions, the tier two, tier three fire risk regions. And we have some areas we still need to uh, implement and install more cameras. We anticipate about a thousand cameras throughout the state of California by the end of this year, beginning of next year. As Dr. Brown said, this is a consortium. The University of Nevada, Reno, led by Dr. Graham Kent, UC San Diego and Scripps, and the University of Oregon, led by Dr. Doug Toomey. So here, um, when I made this slide at the beginning of the week, we were at 830 cameras. We've put in a handful more since then. And here, CAL FIRE is critical in this enterprise. They're California's firefighters, and they have priority to move the pan tilt zoom cameras. They also help us understand what data types they need. We build everything. We have access cameras. Um, we're now using uh, 6075E. We build the Rhone towers, the solar panels, the microwave dishes. This here is up in Sonoma County, and you can see the camera to the right. We also build smaller stations so that here we can deploy them in fire season to get better views of where fires are starting and fire behavior. This here on the right, this box shows the batteries, solar panel in the middle. So we have on every site, we have five days resilience. So if the power goes down or there's a power, a public safety power shut off by the utilities, our stations stay up. Resilience is the name of the game. So here are these cameras over here on the right, you'll see the camera in yellow. You'll see the area that's imaged in orange. And we're looking out over the mountaintops here. And I, I like showing this picture because there's still snow on the ground. So here, if you just focus in on over here in this area, if you see my cursor, you'll see that we can blow up. So we can detect ignition extremely well. We can also use this tool to look at soil erosion after a fire, revegetation, all of these things. We're building giant data sets, 12 million images a day, petabytes a year, that will allow us to better understand the impacts of fire on the landscape and the atmosphere. We can time lapse up to 12 hours. So if you think you see a fire, you can pull up this panel, and you get a menu where you can look at the camera for the last 12 hours, six hours, 15 minutes. This helps confirm ignition and make sure that we're not looking at a dust devil or uh, shadowing. This gives us confidence of uh, finding and confirming the fire. We also can do triangulation. So here you see the fire ignition in the, in the main frame. And then you look over here, the camera that's being uh, looked at right now is the one in yellow with its view shed. But the other two cameras were pointed to the fire. And then this gives us a way to get lat long. So here, a really interesting aspect of research we've been doing. This is Ursa Major, or as most of us know it, is the Big Dipper. So we can use the constellation and lookup tables so we can predict by the, act, the orientation of the camera where these stars should be. So the prediction is the red, the actual location of the stars is white. So we can really constrain the azimuth of the camera. We can also determine how it deviates from horizontal. Both of these introduce uncertainty that we can't accept. We need to know the angle of the cameras so we can triangulate 
and get a lat long. So now we can marshal our resources, deploy them, or know if the, the real estate is unaccessible by engines and we have to do air attack right away. We can change the base map. So here, the base map was Google Earth. Here, people can scroll down and they can look at where the fire is with respect to the roads. And you can blow this up and look at where it is with respect to your neighborhood. So here, people are empowered. They know where the fires are with relative to them and they can start making decisions. So here again, just a blow up. If you look back here, you can see this rock outcrop um, showing some of my geology background. Here you can see that outcrop blown up. So confirming ignition with this system is highly effective. Fires make their own weather. And this is really important. This is the wall fire from about five miles away. Look at the tornadic activity. Okay, so the car fire spawned uh, EF3 tornadoes, 150 mile an hour winds. The, the uh, Creek Fire just last year spawned two uh, EF1 tornadoes. So these fires make their own weather and this drives where the fire goes. So detailed instruments and weather stations are critical so that we can understand the regional weather patterns and wind as well as the local weather that's impacted by the fires. The cameras give us really great insight into fire behavior. I'm showing this slide here. This is the campfire, devastating loss of life with this fire. If you see in the upper left panel, there's some evidence of smoke, but you're not completely confident whether this is smoke or clouds. But here, when you're Five minutes in, you know this is a wildfire. And this wildfire, you can see that in 35 minutes, it's a monster. We now go from being on the offense to the defense and evacuation. These cameras help with those evacuations. So this here is the lilac fire. This is December 7th, 2017. Fire season is getting longer. It's moving into December and January. I'd like you to pay attention to the upper right frame. So here we go. You can see the antenna. It's windy, 50, 60 miles an hour, dry, single digit humidity. You can see dust devils. There it goes. There goes the lilac fire. And once we saw this and Chief Meacham from Cal Fire saw this, he reallocated his resources he sent more brigades to this fire, battalions. So he was able to change his strategy based on what he could see and observe real-time, actionable real-time data. This is looking out towards Ramona. And here we had a house fire. The cameras, we knew there was a fire there because it was in a densely populated area in Ramona. But we were able to lead the cameras on there to make sure that we actually extinguish the fire and there was no subsequent flare up. This was during red flag condition. Again, 40 to 50 mile an hour winds. Santa Ana, dry, single digit. Back in 03 and 07, we had the Cedar and Witch fire start in the exact same area. Here you can see the sky crane of SDG&E. We had positioned it in Ramona ahead of time based on the weather forecasts, the detailed weather forecasts that are afforded by these weather stations. We can now pre-position assets so we can get on fires in the incipient phase, get on the fires earlier. Every fire starts small. I've dropped a pin where this house fire was. And on the left, I'm showing the extent of the cedar fire. And here you'll notice if you locate yourself, Julian, Ramona, Poway, you'll see that the house fire is in the exact same corridor as the 03 Cedar fire, the 07 Witch fire. So here we wanted to make sure in these Santa Ana conditions, we didn't have a rekindle. We can look at what happened in the Cedar fire, 15 fatalities, over 2000 homes, dozens of commercial properties. This was the largest fire in the history of California at this time, 273,000 acres, billions of dollars. The Kincaid fire, 
This was in October 23, 2019. We're gonna look here at the Kincaid fire igniting. So here, I want you to watch this little bright light. This is the power station at Geyser Peak and the, the Geyser Peak fire station. This is a wind event, uh, power line dropped. And so here, um, there's the start of the fire. And this is on the Barnum camera. And at St. Helena dispatch, uh, Chief Ben Nichols could see this and it changed the way they responded to this fire. So this fire was horrific. It just here, you can see it in the near infrared. And as it gets closer, it will actually trip back to visual light. We have a sensor on the cameras and it'll trip back. It was so bright that it was like daytime conditions. There you can see it. These fires are horrific. It almost burnt down our camera. We lost about a dozen cameras last year. So on the left, here's the Kincaid fire. The Tubbs fire, um, 2017, the Pocket, the Nuns, all of these fires back then had many fatalities. They didn't have any intelligence on the fires, where they were, how to evacuate. The Kincaid fire, we were able to evacuate 170,000 people throughout the course of the fire without loss of life. This just shows here from the Copernicus Sentinel satellite, the uh, clouds of smoke being blown offshore. Um, when they're blown onshore in our cities, they cause these cascading disasters. I'm gonna show you here, uh, this is work we're doing with SimTable. We work with industry, we work with the private sector, we work with other universities, both within UC and um, other states. So the fire front is shown there. We're gonna rotate now and use our cameras and show the perimeter of the fire. So the battalion chief, he can sit there and watch where the fire is flaring up, how it's changing in three dimensions, what areas are being threatened, where do we need to sequence evacuations? These data are critical for giving us the, the actionable real-time data. So here, we had huge lightning fires last year. This is the LNU lightning complex. I'm just going to show you this is work this with SimTable, and I'll let them talk for a second. Lightning strikes and fire ignitions on the LNU lightning complex fire using our platform Realtimer. For this analysis, we used four cameras from the alert wildfire.org camera, including Lake Berryessa, Lake Berryessa East, Atlas Peak West, and Sonoma Mountain. The lightning storm primarily responsible for these ignitions came out of the south. With this grid view of the cameras, you can watch as the lightning storm rolls through the area. This set of cameras captured over 40 lightning strikes associated with this storm. Okay, so storm I, I will post lightning. this, but I don't have time today to go through that whole video. But what we're able to do is we're able to look at lightning strikes associated with ignitions. And then we can monitor how that fire behavior is growing in which direction. We give this information to uh, colleagues at the San Diego supercomputer, Wi-Fi, and they can use this to drop a pin and start the ignition. We also work with TechnoSilver who does similar type modeling. This modeling is crucial for trying to understand where the fire is gonna go given the weather conditions, the topography and the fuels. So here they're able to take the ignition and make predictions about where the fire is going to be. Then we can look at where the fire is and how it's growing and keep iterating. So we have the best real-time information. This just shows the lightning strikes with ignition. This is Wi-Fi, uh, TechnoSilver wildfire analyst. They also uh, predict where fires are gonna go. This is a quick simulation of La Jolla, a fire driven by the marine layer, which the reason I'm showing this is this was very much like the uh, Palisades fire. It was driven by uh, winds from the west, moisture laden winds, but you can see the fire still is very, uh, uh, this is a disaster in populated regions. So we have cascading disasters. This here, as we all know, is one of our cherished monuments. 
where we go to have a, a, a brain bath. This is Yosemite, sunrise on El Capitan. And you can see Half Dome in the background. Well, this was after the Ferguson fire, 2018. We had to shut down Yosemite for air quality reasons. This is here looking at Half Dome, the Creek fire. Just air quality issues are huge. This is Sacramento. The air quality was so bad that it refracted in the atmosphere. And you actually can see the corona of the sun. I took this picture from Sacramento Airport. So air quality, one related diseases. We can map where the plumes of smoke are going with the camera network. We can predict downstream areas that will have poor air quality. We also have atmospheric rivers. This atmospheric river in June 2018, right after the Thomas fire, two people lost their life in the Thomas fire. This atmospheric river overnight, January 8th, 2018, 23 people lost their lives. So there's landslides. How do fires make the substrate and, and root structure so that these landslides have a greater propensity to happen? All of these things. This was Big Sur debris flow just this year that closed down Route 1. So here, again, these fires, they weaken the root structure. Um, you get rainfall and you get massive debris flows and erosion. We also have CO2 issues. These fires shown here in orange release much more, almost an order of magnitude more uh, metric tons, million metric tons of CO2 equivalent than we save in cap and trade. We need to start thinking about this, managing the forests and how these wildfires, because we're maybe not doing controlled burns and management, how uh, they burn more. We need to think about this and this is not an easy problem. This is very complex. We have millions of dead trees. You can just see here the dead tree um, from past years and newly dead trees. It, it, we're in the hundreds of millions. You can see them here, Crestman, California. These trees uh, just uh, are a huge continuous source of dry, combustible, large woody material, severe fires. We've seen this. This is our, our sister state, Colorado, that shares the same problem with dead trees, lodgepole pine, temperatures, drought, pestilence, pine bark beetle. So these here are just standing uh, ready for lightning ignition. And we need to think of how we manage our forests, both federal and state. Droughts are longer and stronger. I don't have to tell you this. Here, we're actually using all sorts of data types, photogrammetry, hyperspectral, LIDAR, to, this is, these are data points, billions of data points. So we're able to map the vegetation, the fuel load. We're able to look at the moisture in the soils. All of this is important. This is the campfire. We can project the campfire on these large data sets that we're collecting. So the incident commander can see this in the field. We can project it on bare earth models. We're projecting it on large screen and fusion centers so that we can digest all of this data and get the information out to the incident commander. We're also allowing all our data to be used by AI companies so they can improve machine learning and trying to understand uh, you know, artificial intelligence. And, and is it there yet? No, but we're getting better. So using our camera data, they're able to look and detect ignition. And they're getting better. 911 is still the most effective uh, in time, but these AI systems are getting better. And there's a number of companies that we let them use our data. Finally, we have quilts. So you can go in, you can look at uh, the cameras in map view, and you can look at all the cameras in a tile. And hopefully you see this at the end of the day, we see a beautiful sunset in the golden state of California rather than a fire. So we have the eyes on the wildfire, early confirmation. We pump this out to our colleagues and in universities and in industry, firefighters. Every fire starts small. We need to fight these in the incipient phase. As was pointed out, 2018 was the worst wildfire disaster in California history in terms of loss of life and structures destroyed. 
2020 was worst in terms of acres burnt. We need early confirmation and situational awareness to marshal our resources and sequence evacuations. And what, what I'd like to end with is we've built the California Village. Everyone, we have almost 100 sponsors and partners. Become one, use the data. The data are only as important as they impact decisions and science and research. And we, this is all open source. This is the strength of the University of California, the system of universities and the collaboration amongst them is critical to how we move forward and save lives and protect livelihoods. Thank you for your time and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Neil, that was uh, tremendous. It, what a tremendous resource for the state and using the open science model that you've used. It helps first responders, it helps our utilities, it helps uh, all the people who live in, in California. So thank you first and foremost for all the work that I know that you've done over the years with regard to this. Importantly, it creates a data set, as you were saying, that uh, will be available so we can better model uh, both uh, the uh, onset and the movement and, uh, and severity of the fire. So thank you. We already have a number of questions and we're gonna take a few minutes now, if you don't mind, uh, to address those. For the, the number one question that's been coming in by se from several people is, do you have any data on how it actually is used, meaning affects response time? Could you talk a little bit about that? I know yeah, we'll so, hear about this in the next uh, right. uh, symposium. So here, you, yeah. Right. So um, I'm, I'm going to just use some anecdotes uh, from Chief Meacham. He's California Fire Chief. He's worked the longest with us because we started this system with San Diego Gas and Electric in the San Diego County region. And I want to um, tip my hat to SDG&E for their vision, Caroline Wynn. Um, this was a huge step forward for both of us and started alert wildfire. So here, Chief Meacham, uh, we work together. He uses these cameras. Uh, he has his uh, firefighters use the cameras to confirm ignition and it saves 20 minutes sometimes, sometimes an hour. And here's what he said. This time saved at the start of a fire, words can't convey how important this time frame is. So the critical first 15, 30 minutes of a fire where we can fight it in the incipient phase, air attack, ground attack. And, and these are fires when there's wind. When there's no wind, the fires are still a problem, but much less. So we can, we can get borders around them. We can start you know, getting them uh, confined. When it's blowing 50, 60 miles an hour with single digit humidity, we need to fight fast and get on these fires before they explode. So um, on average, about 20 minutes, 30 minutes, but it varies with how remote the area is, whether you can get access with a, uh, an engine or you have to put uh, air you know, fixed or rotary wing uh, up, up to test out where the fires are. So Fantastic. great, great Thank question. You. Thank you. Um, I have another practical question, then we have a couple of scientific questions, but a practical question that came in is, how can we ensure that these early alert systems don't fail when we need them the most? So we've demonstrated for the last five years, we have redundancy. We have a number of pathways to bring the data back. We call this backhaul. So because it's our microwave system, we manage it and we make sure that there's uh, duplication where we build uh, multiple acquisition systems and proxy servers and paths that the data are brought from the back country. So if one camera gets burnt over, then we switch to another path, the quickest path out. So we're constantly increasing the resilience of the system, but I would tell you this, it's our microwave system. We've built it and we have the experts that know how to keep this up. We have batteries and solar panels. So if the power goes down, we have five days of backup power at each site. So we're really concerned. That's an excellent question. And it keeps me awake at night um, 
making sure I think of every way to harden this system and make it resilient. So thank you. Yeah, resilience is really the key, isn't it? Yes. Um, uh, question for you here. You, uh, we, we mentioned that this is really a multi-hazard alert system. Correct. Uh, and uh, so could you talk a little bit about things like uh, topographical features, like the elevation or the ruggedness or the, the uh, steepness of slopes yeah, on the post-fire watershed and hydrogeomorphic behavior? Right. So here, um, I study uh, sediment transport. So I have a number of hats that I wear, um, being uh, I study earthquakes and offsets of faults, stepovers, but here fires destroy the root structures. And unfortunately in California, we have these atmospheric rivers where they get locked in and you can get five, 10 inches of precipitation over the course of two or three days. And now you've destroyed the root structure that holds the surficial sediment in and these steep slopes, like in the San Inez and Montecito, California is tectonically deforming in front of our eyes. And that's what creates these steep slopes, these mountainous regions. And so here, when you combine a steep slope where you're near the angle of repose, and what that means is that sediment can, if you tilt it a little more, sediment will move. If you tilt it a little less, it'll stay there. So now, Imagine you're at the angle of repose and you destroy all those root structures. And now you have soils that it rains on in five, six, seven inches. All of a sudden you have all the conditions for a landslide or a mudslide. These mudslides and landslides move at 10 to 15 miles an hour. They're devastating. They entomb you. It, it, it's a dangerous situation. So we call these cascading disasters. So the fire hits and then we, we go from the dry season to the wet season and then the rain hits and it's the perfect conditions to engender landslides on these steep slopes. Great question. And a lot of people are studying this, um, especially uh, in light of some of the fires um, in Santa Cruz and destruction of the vegetation and impact on the hydrology, the runoff versus uh, percolation you know, so here, when you ruin all the root structures and plants, the ratio of runoff to infiltration changes, and then that impacts our drinking water and our reservoirs. So it's a very complex problem, and I know that other speakers in this series are going to talk to hydrology and impacts on our water quality and how the aquifers are recharged. It's remarkable how interconnected uh, everything in the um, environmental ecosystem is. Uh, and uh, related to that, there was another question, uh, Dr. Driscoll, that came in uh, that, uh, that is as follows. Don't wildfires provide a double whammy in relation to climate change? They contribute to ash and to greenhouse gases uh, in the atmosphere that kills trees and bushes. Uh, that could remove the CO2 from the atmosphere. Um, how are these factors uh, considered in the California climate change mitigation efforts? If you could speak to that, if not how, how they should be. <laughs> right, so here, really good question. And um, we're, we're in a time of extreme climate, weather whiplash on short terms, long-term trends where droughts are more prevalent in the West, we saw the polar vortex plummet Texas and the central countries into a deep freeze. We look at hurricanes that are longer and stronger seasons. So here, I showed quickly the slide. Um, I, I didn't want to go into it in depth, but these wildfires release millions of metric tons of CO2 equivalent. And the, the, the trees and the forests, especially the dead trees that are the standing combustible, high density carbon. Um, when these fires happen, like the Rim fire up in the Sierra, it, it released, they estimate almost 10 million metric tons of CO2 equivalent. The estimates are in 2017 that the fires in California increased the global budget by two parts per million. 
So here we're at about 418 parts per million CO2. And back for the last 800,000 years, uh, prior to 1950, we never exceeded like 330 parts per million. So this is a huge problem, but fires are a natural part of California before development and uh, along these corridors, the urban rural interface, we had fires and these fires burnt many acres. Um, we built up, burnt over 4 million acres just last year. So here, the thing we have to start thinking about, and your question, it's a really complex question and we could speak all day to this, is how do you manage fires so that you don't have these huge fires? How do you develop a better design of how we move into this rural interface where everyone wants to live away from the crowds and in the mountains. Um, so here, CO2 liberated by fires is a big contribution to CO2 in the atmosphere that then gets in the ocean. The oceans are warming up very fast. Sea level rise is much faster. It's on the order of three to four millimeters per year. Um, we're conducting, as Roger Ravel said, we're conducting the world's greatest experiment with CO2. And, and your question's a great one. I hope I touched a little bit on it, but um, it's so complicated that it's like an onion. We could just peel a layer off and another layer off and another layer off. So um, thank you for that question. Dr. Driscoll, um, there are several questions that have come in um, uh, that relate to issues around communication. Um, so I'm going to ask you the first part, uh, and then uh, after your answer, I'll come back to the second part. The first part has to do with all those organizations that you've put together that have been that uh, are involved in this uh, statewide, actually Western region wide effort. Can you say anything about the communication between those organizations? Does this information get to them? Any, anything that you could say about that? Right, so here, I'm gonna use the example of a public safety power shutdown, which is employed by the utilities in high wind events, Diablo, Santa Ana, when there's single digit humidity. And there's a likelihood uh, that some of their infrastructure might be impacted by these high winds. So then alert wildfire has to really ramp up its game. So our wireless internet service providers talk to us, we talk to each other. So by building this village, we have all of these partners that are responsible for their network of cameras. Some might be 10 or 12. Digital Path has over 140 cameras they've installed for us and service. We have Geolinks, which is another great partner that probably has about 250 cameras. So all of a sudden, this village, when we go into red flag conditions, the first responders are talking all the time on chat boards and, and uh, reallocating resources. In the old days, Northern California used to burn first than Southern California. So it would migrate some of our first responders north. That's not the case anymore. The fires start in both. So now we have less resources at any one time for a given region. And air, the perfect thing as you can see behind me on the shoulder is we're now with air attack, we can fly helicopters at night. We can't fly the big fixed swing, but we have much better communication and CAL FIRE organizing all the other agencies and the military it's an incredible network of communication and all of these people. And, and I just want to say um, to UNR, Graham Kent, University of Oregon, Doug Toomey, that together we've made this quilt of organizations that, that really is making a difference. Fantastic. You know, this is really the uh, backbone for a database that could be used in so many different ways. I know we're going to hear from Ilkay Altintis uh, in the next session about linkage to first responder organizations, yep. but there's another question or uh, topic that was raised, and that has to do with the impacts of the fire. 
um, their uh, and, and uh, public health alerts. Could you imagine or envision how this might be linked to efforts at other UC campuses or uh, other uh, academic research institutions right. where the focus is on communicating health risks to the public? So here, just to start off, some areas like the Salt and Trough and Owens Valley have air quality issues because uh, the water um, supply has been diminished and you're exposing fine grain particulate matter that's easily entrained in the wind. So there's a number of organizations that are keenly interested in how, how air quality impacts uh, lung related diseases. These fires, um, amazing things uh, we've started to notice is that they, they actually impacted COVID-19. So people that were in areas of smoke were more susceptible or had worse cases of the COVID-19. So the air quality, it's being studied by uh, scientists um, at Scripps, and they just released a paper on how air quality um, and, and lung-related diseases and emergency room visits. So the cameras can actually map where the plume of smoke is going. Yeah. And Ilke and others, Technosilva, SimTable, they actually then take the weather conditions and the wind speeds and the topography and start predicting where it'll go. So we can watch where it is and we can predict where it will go. Back after the campfire, um, Sacramento, the air quality there was horrific. And the Creek Fire up at Mammoth Lakes, they had to evacuate many people because of the air quality. So, um, and this air, uh, and, and it has not just smoke, but it has other carcinogens in it. And we saw in the Woolsey fire that firefighters had elevated mercury in their lungs. So this is a really important question and it's a cascading disaster, but we're gonna probably see as fires continue and the fire season gets longer and stronger that we're gonna have more health related issues. You know, thank you so much. There, there, we could go on with questions uh, for a long time. We have just two minutes left and I thought I would just, turn uh, back to you and ask you if you have anything that you'd like to convey to California decision makers in um, corporate uh, areas and governmental areas or civic and philanthropic sectors. Uh, the stage will be yours for just a minute or two, uh, and then we'll turn it back over to Vice President Maldonado. Okay, yeah. thank you. So first, um, the state of California, the vision of our governor, Governor Gray Davis, um, working together with us has been very impressive. Their vision of how technology is, and science is gonna inform us and allow us to make best decisions, best practices, um, that incredible. And when, when politics and science collide, it's good. It allows us to make good decisions and base those decisions on results that other people can confirm data that you have to be able to have other people replicate your observations. And then we can interpret it different, but the data has to be robust and repeatable. And I am so impressed with this administration in California and their drive and understanding of the CO2 problem that's facing California. And I'm proud to be a Californian because we respect the environment and respect diversity and we, we use science to make decisions. California is gonna lead the United States and the United States is gonna lead the world on this problem. And CO2 is the biggest threat facing the West and the United States. And we, we are gonna rely on our ingenuity. We've faced issues, it's not all gloom and doom, Chesapeake Bay, Boston Harbor, San Diego Bay, San Francisco Bay are much cleaner today than they were 20 years ago. We just have to be committed to turning the corner, listening to the music and playing the right tune. And the tune is start today. We don't have time to think about this tomorrow or put it off to the next generation. Start today. 
Thank you, Dr. Driscoll. Uh, great way to end uh, such an informative session. And I think it's just uh, an amazing example of how the science that unfolds from the UC system can be of value to the state, can have an impact on our citizens, uh, on our uh, economy, and on the future. So thank you. And with that, I'll turn it back to Vice President Maldonado. Thank you, Dr. Brown, very much. Dr. Driscoll, that was amazing. Thank you so much for participating in this event and sharing your work. It has a huge impact. We really appreciate it. And there were many questions that popped into the Q&A. Obviously, we could not get to them, but I assure you we are capturing all of the questions and every one of you in the audience who has asked a question, you will get a response after the event. Thank you so much for participating. Now I would like to transition to our first panel, who will be led by Dr. Pramod Kargonkar, who is the Vice Chancellor for Research and Distinguished Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of California at Irvine. Pramod. Thank you, Vice President Maldonado, and I am very pleased to be here. And what a fantastic symposium to showcase the power of 13, uh, the 10 campuses and three national labs to serve the state of California and citizens of California with uh, the knowledge and expertise of our faculty uh, and researchers. So we are now ready to uh, start our first panel session, uh, uh, which is focused on modeling, visualization, big data, data science, uh, types of techniques to inform risk assessments and decision-making in the context of wildfires. For this session, we have four world-class experts in different aspects of wildfires, and I'll introduce them one by one. Each one of them will have about 10 minutes or so to speak, and that will leave some time for question and answer at the end of their presentations. Our first speaker is Professor Michael Golden, from the Department of Earth System Science at UC Irvine. He's a world leading expert in how terrestrial ecosystems work with participation from colleagues across UC campuses, including UC Merced. He directs the Innovation Center for Advancing Ecosystem Climate Solutions, a three year state funded project with the goals of improving long-term carbon sequestration, reducing wildfire risk and bolstering resilience in the face of climate change. Michael? Thanks, Pramod. Um, wow, that was an impressive previous talk. Uh, let me go ahead and share screen here. Okay, I assume you can um, see my screen now. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm gonna be, uh, presenting uh, on, oops. I'm gonna be presenting on behalf of the Center for Ecosystem Climate Solutions. And um, this is a large project. It's, it's funded by the state's uh, Strategic Growth Council. We're about a year and a half into the project. And, you know, obviously I'm biased, uh, but I think we have a very strong team. Uh, we have many researchers uh, from from various um, UCs. Uh, we have strong links um, beyond the, the UC. Uh, we've established strong links with uh, various um, state agencies, various uh, stakeholders. Our uh, uh, goal, and, and I think it's actually a goal that's, that's probably shared by, by a lot of the folks on this call, is to develop geospatial data sets, and to run geospatial analyses that, that can be used to help the state ensure its water supply, reduce wildfire hazard, improve forest health, um, protect carbon stocks. And, and we, we see this uh, as, as just a, a deeply mechanistically coupled problem. Um, the, the goal um, as, as we see it really should be to develop solutions that address all of these issues simultaneously. Uh, they all interact and focusing just on one of them 
Uh, I, don't, I don't think it's gonna get us where we wanna be. So um, for example, if you single-mindedly try to pack as much carbon on the landscape as, as you possibly could, you, you might initially do some good uh, for the greenhouse gas um, problem, but you're gonna create a whole bunch of other problems. You're gonna, uh, you're gonna start to uh, reduce runoff, uh, you're, you're going to uh, build up fuels, you're going to increase wildfire hazard, uh, you're going to um, uh, drive up drought stress, you're going to have deleterious effects on, on forest health. So our goal uh, within the center is to develop the, the information so that we can start to produce um, a more balanced strategies that, that simultaneously address all of these problems. Um, a, a, a lot of our focus ha, has been on developing geospatial uh, data sets and, and, and running uh, geospatial analyses. Initially, um, we're, we're uh, sharing these uh, data sets using uh, web-based visualization tools. Um, some of these are, are becoming uh, open. Some of them are just uh, internal at this point as, as we vet things and, and understand what's going on. But ultimately, we're going to share everything uh, that, that we produce. Uh, we've, we've worked hard on this, um, but I got to say um, that, that a lot of what we've been able to accomplish um, has, has really benefited by the ideas and, and <clears throat> Back from um, state agencies, from land managers, and frankly, from other scientific groups that are that are going after similar um, problems. I, you know, at least um, scientifically, it, it's a, it's a pretty good situation. Um, people have been very very generous uh, sharing their ideas. So what I'm going to do now is I, I'm I'm going to show you a video uh, that walks you through some of the data layers um, and tools that, that we're working on just to give you a flavor of, of where this is going. Um, this this uh, first, first tool um, shows a couple of the data layers. This is a vegetation type. Um, red areas are shrublands, blue, excuse me, blue areas are shrublands, red or herbaceous, green or forest. The powerful thing about this data set though is that it's at 30 meter resolution and it's every single year since 1984. So it's a stack a time series. You can see how the vegetation has moved around. This, uh, the one showing now is, is gross primary production. That's photosynthesis. Um, again, a stack of photosynthesis at 30 meters by the state. This is, uh, this is water production. This, this is where our water comes from. It comes from the mountains, comes from the North Coast. Again, a stack of, of 30 meters where that water is coming from. This is tree biomass. Um, where, where the carbon uh, is stored on the landscape, the mountains, the North Coast predominantly. Uh, this is fine fuels. Uh, the, these are the dead leaves and, and the fine twigs and, and the shrubs that, that really contribute um, to market fire growth. Uh, we can then start to stack these different data layers and, and create um, something like this. The areas that are blue, higher elevation, those are, that's where the water comes from. Green areas, that's where there's a lot of biomass. Orange areas, that's where there's a lot of fine fuel. It's an elevation gradient. Lower elevation, you gotta worry about fire. Higher elevation, the, the focus it, it should be water. Um, I've, I've flipped over here now to another um, visualization tool to look at fire. This initially shows a, a map of fuels, areas that are, are blue or cyan. That's where you have a lot of these fine fuels. Green is forest fuels. Red is herbaceous. We're looking now uh, at the rough fire. Uh, and, and now we're actually looking at, at the fire spread day by day. Rough fire happened in 2015. Uh, these, this is an analysis of, of satellite observations. So you can actually see the fire, how it, it progressed day by day. Uh, now we're looking at, at that fire progression but we're also seeing the fuels. And so you can see lightning strike, the fire, you know, some days it blows up, some days it doesn't. The days that it really blows up, it's the confluence of, of the extreme weather, but it's also really these, this sort of cyan colored, uh, dense uh, fine fuel areas 
living up now. We're looking at the Creek Fire. Um, uh, this this one burned uh, burned out the um, San Joaquin, uh, much of the San Joaquin Basin. Really, the same same basic deal. It's it's when it hit these sort of shrub belts, these these um, shrubby, dense, high fuels. That's that's when it really um, takes off. This this was a, a remarkable remarkably bad fire, and you can see that was just the second day. <sighs> totally totally uh, blew up. Um, this has us focusing on on the importance of, of this shrub belt, especially for these Sierra um, uh, uh, fires. So uh, so we uh, using this stack of vegetation um, distribution, we we can start to ask questions like. How has the distribution of, of shrublands changed? So now we're looking at, uh, on the left-hand side, we'll, we'll look at the 1985 distribution of shrublands. Right side, 35 later, years later, 2018, slided back and forth. So that's uh, 2018 showing now. And, and that's 1985 back to, to 2018. And, and you can see an increase in the area of shrubland over that 35 year period. Lots going on there. Um, you know, effects of tree die off, effects of, of previous fires, um, but, but a clear increase in, in the area of shrubland. Um, this this kind of ties, ties us back to, to this coupled system. And um, within this uh, data layer, uh, a series of data layers, you, you start to see a lot of these mechanistic linkages and, and you can start to understand how, how these things are gonna play out. So you have drought, you have, you have warming, that, that's gonna contribute to die off. Um, it's, it's gonna, uh, which in turn is, is going to have effects on fuels. Um, again, the warming and, and, and uh, drought uh, coupled with these changes in fuels are, are gonna have effects on, on wildfire probability severity. And then those are gonna feed back to, to water, to biomass, uh, to vegetation type. So it, it really is a densely coupled system. Uh, to conclude, um, you know, we're, we're moving forward. Um, we're very uh, uh, committed to doing the best science we can, but we're also very committed to uh, translating this information into um, useful, actionable, um, uh, data sets that, 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 um, that do good. Um, so, you know, we'll continue to develop these tools with input from stakeholders. We're going to continue to focus on our science um, questions. And, and we have a lot of planning and coordination uh, to do. And, and, and a lot of that is within our group. But frankly, a lot of that planning and coordination is, is really with this larger um, collection of people assembled here today. So that's it. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Mike. And we will get back to you uh, during the question and answer at the end of the panel. So stay, stay tuned. Our uh, next speaker is Dr. Rodman Lin, senior scientist from the Los Alamos National Lab, where he leads the atmospheric modeling team. And he's an expert in solving, modeling solving and modeling problems involving complex thermal, mechanical, and fluid dynamical systems and their application to wildfire behavior modeling. Rod? Thank you. Uh, get my screen shared here. And we should be going. So, um, so I'm going to take a, a slight shift in the uh, in the approach to this. And in so doing so, I'm going to also shift some scales to much finer scales. But I want to really emphasize up front that uh, the work I'm presenting here is work that Los Alamos has been doing in collaboration with a, a variety of uh, UC-based projects like Wi-Fi and, and Sparks as well as uh, we have a longstanding collaboration with the US Forest Service and Tall Timbers Research Station. So this is, this is definitely a collective and collaborative set of thoughts that I'm gonna talk about. And what I really want to, to drive home is that we have an opportunity to start changing the way we approach fire and that's gonna drive 
uh, a need for new science. So fire suppression alone is not working. I think we can all look at California over the past decade and agree with that. Um, and science and policymakers and practitioners are all coming to the conclusion that we need a more proactive approach to wildland fire. Um, that's going to include um, more prescribed fire, uh, more strategic use of fuel treatments, um, and, and understanding when wildfires can be managed for resource benefit. However, when we're doing this kind of proactive approach, the deliberate decisions for planning and execution do require a new science basis. Suddenly we've got to think uh, more carefully about ecosystem health. We've got to think more carefully about where smoke is going. Um, how do we safely achieve our ecologic or risk reduction objectives without putting people or communities or infrastructure at, at risk? This is a multi-scale planning problem, uh, both in terms of space, because we want to think about our landscape as a whole, as well as time. These are, we want to think years in advance, we want to think days in advance or hours in advance. The economics now, when we're making these deliberate decisions, there's a lot of economic cause and effect relationships we need to think about. And of course, public opinion and public support, having the right science to help explain things to the public and gain their support is gonna be critical. So this is, this is very different than when it's chased the big bad growing wildfire, which uh, most people are in agreement. That's, that's something that we need to do. So let me just start by talking about prescribed fire analysis and, and what we can be doing there. So we can be thinking about how science can help us optimize prescribed fires to safely, safely meet objectives. This can be refining prescription windows. We don't wanna be uh, cavalier with our prescription windows and cause unneeded risks, but we also don't wanna be overly conservative and that prevents us from getting fire in the landscape. One of the things about prescribed fire is we have the opportunity or practitioners have the opportunity, I should say, to engineer the fire behavior and the smoke behavior through their ignition strategies. That's different techniques and the movies on the on the right show on the far far the two panels on the far right are line ignition and the other one is an aerial ignition, uh, which the the rate of growth here and the burnout pattern become different based on how you ignite it, what the patterns, what the ignition density is, and how fast you ignite it. How much fire are we putting on the landscape at a given point in time? And practitioners are very skilled at doing this. Um, but we need to provide additional science for them to explore and communicate their confidence uh, with these techniques. Uh, we need to think about how do we help them develop contingency uh, options? How do, how do they understand the thresholds of wind fire behavior can change rapidly, say, as the diurnal cycle changes the, the dead fuel moistures on the ground uh, in the middle of the day? And, and how do we allow them to better uh, account for the uncertainties in the conditions at which they're anticipating uh, next week or tomorrow or even a year from now? Um, and certainly this goes back to the multi-scale planning. How do we, if we have a wildfire, that's oftentimes an unfortunate event, but wildfire creates opportunities to get more prescribed fire on the landscape because you've already put down pre-burned areas that you can use as backdrops and, and prevent uh, spread of, of, un, of prescribed fires into, into undesired areas. So I think this is an important context to start thinking about how do we leverage the wide amount of science that UC brings to bear on this. So in addition to just prescribed fire and the fire activity that we're trying to manage we're also having to think about when we put deliberate fire on the landscape, where is the smoke going? People are far less accepting and far less tolerant uh, of a prescribed fire that puts smoke into their community, whereas a wildfire, they understand there's not much that, that can be done about it. So when prescribed fire practitioners are, are lighting fires, they have to consider, how does my ignition technique, whether it's aerial or line ignition, how does, how does that create coalescing plumes that lift the smoke up and get it away? I might wanna create enough intensity that smoke is, 
is getting lofted high, but yet not cause undesired ecological effects or, or risk of escape. So this is another place for science to really, really come to bear on this problem. So um, another piece of this puzzle is thinking about the management or thinning of the landscape. And we may not be able to thin the entire landscape. So it was, question was asked one time about a particular landscape shown here on the right. What if we were to just remove the surface fuels in the bottom of this canyon? Generally, fires are moving lower intensity down the downslope into a canyon. So if you took the opportunity to change the fuels at the bottom of the canyon, how much effect do you have? And so on the, on the right, on the top image, you see, I mean, you see fire that's in an unmanaged situation. And the lower picture on the right, you see fire that's going down into a canyon and uh, reaching an area that's been thinned on the bottom. So we have to think about what are the effects in two ways. Continuous fire spread may not be able to cross that canyon, but we also have to think about what is, is it having an effect on the spotting or on the firebrand transport? Because the firebrand transport oftentimes is how these fires cross these, these canyons. So by looking at fire at these more detailed levels, we can certainly come to grips with some of these ideas. So something I really wanna drive home though, is if we're gonna think about uh, this proactive approach to fire, we need to really rethink how we deal with vegetation. So if we look at the, the poor pictures on the, on the screen at the moment, one might say, oh, those are continuous fuels. Those are homogeneous. But when you start thinking about at the scales of low intensity fire, for instance, prescribed fire or flanking fire or backing fires, none of these fuel beds are actually homogeneous. There are spaces between the fuels. There are spaces that cause a fire to potentially go out in low, low uh, intensity situations. In the upper left, you see a gap between the surface fuels and the overstory. Those gaps, horizontal or vertical, matter a lot. So when we think about uh, addressing these kinds of questions, as well as the ecological effects of fire on the landscape, we really need to think about vegetation in a three-dimensional heterogeneous structure and account for the actual structure. If we're doing fuels management, a lot of times what that's doing is changing the structure, not just reducing the load. And the changes in the structure are just as important as reducing the overall amount of vegetation. The movie on the left shows the convective heating and cooling of a canopy as a surface fire burns underneath the canopy. That convective heating and cooling, which is influenced by the aerodynamic drag of this heterogeneous forest, and thus the structure of the forest, is what's responsible for the survival of many of those canopies uh, or not. So if we're gonna think down this line and think about fire and its connection to the ecosystem, we've gotta address those feedbacks. So this leads us to, um, the need for combining AI and wildfire science to be able to address how do we get at these three-dimensional fuels? How do we do this uh, for say the entire state of California? And, and luckily we've got some, some really nice ways and examples of some initial data fusion uh, to create these landscapes. We need to do the same kind of thing for, uh, for winds at multiple scales. And the thing I wanna leave you with is this idea that if we're going to look at fire and its role on the landscape, we really need to think about fire and its connectivity as brought up by Michael a second ago, its connectivity to other processes on the landscape. Fire is causing injury or fire effects, which is causing changes to the hydrology, which is potentially causing uh, changes in the plant succession. And this feedback uh, translates to things that cause changes in the landscape resilience and ecosystem shifts. And if we're going to take a proactive approach to fire, we need to think about how the timing of, for instance, prescribed fire can change the stability of the ecosystem as it goes forward in time. Thanks. So, and I think uh, I'm gonna leave it right there. Thank you. Thank you, Rod, for that excellent presentation. A lot of good ideas there.
Uh, our next speaker is uh, Leroy Westerling, Professor of Management of Complex Systems from the School of Natural Sciences at UC Merced. Prior to coming to Merced in 2006, he was a postgraduate research meteorologist and project scientist at Scripps Institution of Oceanography. His areas of expertise include climate and wildfire, statistical data analysis, modeling, data visualization, and so forth. Leroy? Hey, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. Thank you, everyone. Uh, let me just share the presentation here. All right. Um, are we good? So um, I'm going to start off by introducing a consortium that is generating a lot of the models and um, data sets that are going to be supporting the assessment of wildfire for the fifth state climate assessment. Um, but in doing that, I'm going to be talking also about linkages to other projects, uh, some of them represented by by uh, the faculty presenting today. Um, within the project itself, uh, we have four main uh, working groups that are focusing respectively on extreme weather, uh, fire behavior, and, and its context in the fuels that others have discussed, uh, where, where we have a lot of standing dead trees and now down dead trees from the previous drought and, and associated beetle kill. Um, a suite of forecast tools uh, for short term out to seasonal, and then a scenario analyses for long term projections and simulation of wildfire through the end of century. And these are all linked together, uh, providing information that feedback. So, for example, the extreme weather uh, category uh, is not just looking at how to better site additional weather stations around the state, but also looking at how recent extreme wildfire events have been shaped by climate, topography, and vegetation in different patterns around the state. And understanding at very fine temporal and spatial scales, the drivers of those extreme events has allowed us to better calibrate our models for long-term projections and how those same, context will evolve with climate change in the future and how that's going to affect fire on the ground. Um, fire behavior, so we're going out and working both in the lab and in the field trying to develop better models for describing how the vegetation could occur in the future. There's unprecedented accumulations of down and dead fuels in California's forests, but also in other parts of the landscape. And then that feeds back into long-term scenarios in a lot of different ways. For example, changing how we characterize the vegetation in, in the present, changing how we think about uh, how fire severity, for example, to play out, so how much biomass burns in future fires uh, under these conditions of change fuels and change climate together. Um, Short-term forecasts, really build on, on uh, existing projects and networks to provide some end-to-end -end ability to simulate fires at a moment's notice in locations where, where there may be a high risk of fire burning, where a fire has just, just started and enables uh, sort of real-time operations uh, use. And then thinking about the long-term projections, so working at a lot of different spatial scales and across a lot of different types of variables from simulating individual extreme wildfire events around the state um, under a lot of different scenarios. And this is a very stochastic process. So uh, even in a really extreme year, if, if you're looking at just a small patch on the landscape, the probability of a big fire igniting in that patch and, and burning out from there is still relatively low. So we do a lot of simulations repeatedly under each of the scenarios. And that allows us to, to at core scales, in the example in the middle plot there, look at sort of what the average area burn, the average fire risk is under different assumptions about future climate, uh, development footprint, fuels management, 
uh, and say the placement of critical infrastructure. And then at the finer spatial scales, we're, we're modeling or simulating rather uh, the fire severities of how much of the landscape burns in each 30 meter pixel for each of the, of the large scale simulated fires across the state. And these uh, simulations here, I'm showing uh, uh, some data from, from the Sierra Nevada first, but this is what we're doing statewide. Uh, really build on work done, for example, by the Center for Ecosystem Climate Solutions. So their, their 30 meter vegetation layers informing how we characterize the current state of fuels, um, how we understand the relationship between those past fuels and, and recent fire events, and then how we modify those fuels going forward under different scenarios about how aggressive the state or how ambitious the state and other entities in California might be about fuels reduction and fuel management. And then as I was discussing earlier at, at both 30 meters and coarser spatial scales we're modeling fire and fire severity. Uh, and we're doing that not just with statistical fire models but also with dynamic vegetation models that allow us to understand how the future fuels will evolve not just as a function of our fuels management scenarios not just the direct impacts of climate, but also how the simulated or projected wildfires will then affect subsequent fire release as they alter the fuels. And then for each of those fires in the future, as well as in, uh, in the recent past, we have uh, a framework for estimating the air pollution emissions. So not just particulate matter, but carbon dioxide, a whole suite of, of emissions for each fire. And one of the characteristics that we've seen for, for reproducing the emissions from recent years is that a handful, a relative handful of very large, very severe recent fires account for a huge fraction of the total particulate matter that's been emitted in California by wildfires since the 1980s. So that allows us to then understand how the fuels management, the uh, can, and can interact with climate change to produce these intense emissions uh, events in the future and understand how that's going to interact with public health and other concerns. Um, I mentioned the fuels management is, a, is an important part of this assessment, not just uh, projections of future climate change. So one of the things that we're doing is working with stakeholders around the state to uh, put together scenarios of sort of current and high ambition uh, fuels management at very fine spatial scale, so 30 meters around the state, aggregating all the different state, federal, and private actors uh, to understand how future uh, fuels might be altered on a sort of annual basis and how that would affect our, our vulnerability to fire and climate change. Um, Working with some of the people here in this panel, as a matter of fact, uh, we, we tried to identify uh, some grand challenges for wildfire science in the state uh, over different time scales that you can see here. Um, the important takeaway is that there are a lot of them and they require a lot of integrated team science. The state has really done a great job uh, recently supporting integrated team science, looking at uh, different aspects of these challenges around the state. Um, if we're lacking anything at the moment, it's really a facility for integrating across these projects. There are so many of them going on at the same time right now, uh, addressing very important parts of this puzzle that we have to solve in order, in order to manage our fire uh, And all of the coordination is basically occurring informally at the present time, uh, because so many of us wear different hats on different parts of these teams. Um, but really to, to be effective and to, to make sure that all the science that we're doing collaboratively across the state feeds into all the different modeling efforts and, and planning and policy efforts, we need to step up our game in terms of how we coordinate uh, fire and climate science across the state. And Thank you, Leroy. <laughs> 
that was a great point to leave uh, the presentation on, which is the need for increased and more effective collaboration. Uh, our next speaker uh, in the panel is uh, Professor Ilke Altintas from UC San Diego, where she has many, many leadership roles. Uh, she's the chief data science officer for the San Diego Supercomputer Center and co-founder of the Wi-Fi Lab. Ilke? Good morning, everyone. Uh, I'm very proud this morning to be a part of the UC San Diego community, and we are all building the uh, building blocks for solving the wildfire problem and hopefully ending devastation by megafires. And as we heard from the wonderful previous talks, um, wildfire technology uses data from a variety of sources, and this could enable data-driven efforts for preparedness, mitigation, and response. Uh, and it can bring the bridge science to society or practical application. And we recognized this about a decade ago that this was going to heat up, so to say. We are having a data-rich environment and it's continuously becoming data-rich. And this creates this highly dimensional situation that we need to then generate insights and value through some things from technology that relates to big data and computing to then use the data to advance fire science and collaboration in team science partnerships and convergence efforts. So we can both generate next generation science collectively and also apply this science to practice. So Wi-Fi that way started uh, as a NSF project um, as a cyber infrastructure, our initial goal was to build dynamic data-driven approaches using real-time data uh, and use you know, black box existing fire modeling efforts to demonstrate this. But even that little that was built was useful in the context of operations. So together with LA Fire Department, we built FireMap that was operationalized in over hundred fires in California and is a part of um, state F state program. But our research in that sense is to combine data science and fire science at scale, uh, both computationally and uh, environmentally, and uh, develop, develop convergence research projects. So also to put in this uh, science and technology to practice, to work. And the first set of products we developed were in the category of data management and integration services. So we develop research and also services on top of this research. And then real-time data-driven fire modeling efforts uh, together with our partners, uh, including uh, you know all the speakers, uh, you know uh, Rod and as we heard from Neil, and we collaborate with Pyrogens, uh, and also uh, mo modeling workflows. So how can we automate and scale these workflows so they become the backdrop to collective uh, efforts at the societal scale, and. Uh, we become a community of growing organizations, over 100 organizations, and we work with our partners in the science and uh, uh, government and industry space uh, in different efforts related to usage of data. And this generates some impact. Um, you know, there's scientific and technical impact that it generates, but also an educational impact, which is also a part of the mission of universities, as we are told. Uh, but there is a public impact here, an operational impact. Uh, as I mentioned, we were used in more than 100 California fires operationally in public-private partnerships. And we are part of a state program called FIRES, which is uh, funded by the California's Office of Emergency Services, Cal OES. Um, and it's about running planes over existing fire and bringing that type of intelligence together with uh, other forms of uh, intelligence like observatory uh, cameras from alert wildfire weather stations and uh, also predicted resources about the weather and the environment. And public also has a huge need for information. You know, we have social media now, public uh, need for information changes. And our websites are flooded with millions of citizens at, the, uh, at each fire now to create some situational awareness. So both at the operational and 
uh, public level, there is a need for interpretability of scientific information and also interpretability of what is going on and the sensing about the environment at the time of the fire and before and after as well. So there's a lot of education efforts at the public level that can be had. So that inspired us to do more. Initially, our efforts were about programmatic access to data through fire modeling efforts. So over the uh, last two years, we worked on with SDGE, &E, our energy company, and uh, our scientific partners, what we call the Wi-Fi Commons. So the goal of the Wi-Fi Commons is to be uh, the bridge between the data and fire science and data and its uh, application, and provide collectively in a collaborative, transparent, inclusive fashion. Um, AI tools for knowledge management, physics guided machine learning, optimization and interpretability using the data. So we can sort of take the data from different sources and collectively turn the data to be more valuable in the context of science and applications. Uh, to this end, we will uh, be referred to as data commons and a model commons. So we actually semantically tag, we uh, developed an ontology that helps us uh, to tag all the data and tools. So they're compatible with each other and compatible with other data sources. And through what we refer to as an as AI gateway with computing and AI libraries in the back end, uh, we are working with also the AI community to then uh, make the data more useful in the context of applications. The first of it was uh, we worked with Rod Lynn, Kevin Hires, uh, Ross Parsons, David Sa, and others um, to develop tools so we can generate 3D fuels using data fusion and fast fuels from US Forest Service together with quick fire so we can develop now prescribed burn products to apply this. So in addition to fire map, we are now developing what we refer to as burn pro 3D, which is for optimization of prescribed burns. And how did we come up with this? We actually created convergence workshops over the last years. For instance, our, one of our workshops was bringing fire science uh, collaborators together so we can understand the needs for AI, but how we can use data better. And data fusion, preparing data for models, interpretation of model products and data products came out of as the biggest requirements. Then we met with the AI community and decided on like, what are the first set of techniques that we should target, again, develop and put it in to common use. Then we also met with practical communities of practice. Um, so one of the things that came up was interpretability of scientific products and data for decision support during, before, after events, and also optimization of these prescribed burn uh, planning uh, because it's very difficult and we are in a fire deficit as we will probably hear more later as well. And we need to get out of the deficit by prescribed burn making those prescribed burns more efficient uh, and collaborative. Um, so that brings us to this continuous iteration integration of AI and also um, automated workflows because now we need scale for interpretation of data and also interpretation of data in the context of modeling that can be interpreted itself. So what are these AI techniques? Um, improving the model predictions uh, using 3D data, and you know, with things like quick fire and fast fuels, we are able to actually model at 30 times higher resolution than we were able to do uh, at, at the fuel level, uh, 30 meter to one meter that is. And here we are using dynamic data fusion and knowledge management techniques and physics guided machine learning for understanding the complex processes within these fire behavior models and maybe generating emulators for similar environment is something that we are focusing on. And then once the science products uh, are enabled, you know, using those science products in the context of societal scale applications for decision support and planning and risks and trade-offs, and here we are using constraint optimization methods and explainable AI techniques. So then what do we learn from data? And that there, that semantic approach and ontology becomes also uh, a big enabler. Um, so what is it for comparison? What is the type of science these are enabling? And we heard these, but in summary, um, in FireMap, we used uh, Farsight from Forest Service and through data assimilation of real-time data and adjustments of parameter estimation and states of the models, 
So by dynamic learning about the real-time situation, we were able to adjust and come up with 2D fire perimeter and give this as a decision support in a matter of minutes uh, in fire map um, using you know, plain intelligence alert wildfire cameras and other forms of information. So uh, and satellite information is becoming more available as well. Uh, but when you look at these, these are 3D and it's about fire perimeter because the decision will be made about evacuations and management of the fire accordingly. Um, when we go to the 3D world and something like fast fuels, for instance, is a huge enabler here, we are now suddenly moving from this to a 3D a fire behavior context. So there we are able to understand the consumption patterns of fuels, what's the fire burning in the environment, how the smoke transports using the quick extensions and quick fire, and what kind of communities it affects. And so truly fire behavior. And that's an information rich environment for decision support in the context of prescribed burns. So this is a quick fire model by Rod and others. Um, and you know, once you have in a sense this 3D fields that we've seen before and quick fire type of simulation to play that again, uh, we can now uh, prepare the environment for optimization of prescribed burns and that type of decision support. So to summarize, something like Wi-Fi and Wi-Fi itself in that sense is built for expansion. And in the UC, we have many tools that we are seeing today uh, to bring diverse geospatial data streams uh, for many geographical areas, but these are patches and collectively through AI, we can use what we learn from these boutique environments uh, to the whole state and also multiple hazards, including mudslides, floods, atmospheric rivers. These are, these are cascading disasters also. Uh, even in COVID-19 context, we were able to use some of this information. And of course, it's going to impact in many technical areas. And I think at UC, that's the type part of our excellence. And uh, you know, in California, we use technology really well. And if we combine science and technology, I think there's a lot of uh, impact to be had at the societal scale and to manage wildfires. Thank you. Thank you, Ilke. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. And uh, let's welcome uh, Mike and uh, Rod and Leroy, uh, we have about nine minutes left uh, in our session. So first, uh, a quick question. Uh, Ilke, you uh, mentioned very well how your data is being made available, data and tools are being made available to others. Mike, uh, questions came in about availability of your data and tools to others. Can you speak to that? Yeah. Well Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, Michael, sorry. I thought, okay, but go ahead, Michael, please. <laughs> sorry. Um, now yeah, I have that, a question. The, the uh, tool on the, um, that shows the fuels and the fire spread, that actually is accessible. Uh, I did not um, post the link in the talk because I'm pretty sure we would have crashed the website. <laughs> um, I will go ahead and put it in the, in the chat, though, and with the caveat that not everyone go there at once. Okay, how about the data sets? Did yeah, they are they are still internal. Um, They're still internal. Do you have plans uh, to make them available to, to others? Absolutely, yeah, yeah. We, our confidence is growing in them. Um, I don't think our confidence is there yet. Okay, uh, thanks, thanks, Michael. And Ilke, I mean, you said a lot about availability of data and tools. So I'm not going to ask you to expand further on that because we have lots and lots of questions on prescribed burns and managed burns. So uh, I'll, I'll begin with this one. Uh, what role do communities play in all these efforts? Uh, and specifically, what have you learned? Have you worked with uh, native tribes uh, and learned from them on managed, on prescribed burns? Rod, you want to take that? So, so we we have um, we've interacted with a number of native tribes in the in the southeast uh, and our connections through tall timbers who has tight connections to to many of those communities and certainly there's a lot there's a lot to a learn from their from their experiences and their practices but also um, a lot to to learn from their respect for for the landscape etc so I think 
certainly, um, I personally have done less of that in California, but I think it's a huge resource to tap and something that needs to be well respected as we go forward because those communities that have experience based practices, um, how do we learn from those and put it in a, and, and use the science to capture that and help them to expand their impact would be great. Anybody else wants to uh, address this issue of where do communities come into, into the loop in, in this whole problem area? So they, it's a part of the public education as well, because we are you know, seeing these concepts of the good fire and the bad fire. Not every fire is scary. Fire is scary when you cannot control it. And not every smoke is bad. So we have an opportunity here to actually communicate that to the public and uh, environmental communities that you know, once we can actually bring up this concept of we can manage fire with fire and the environment needs the fire and the public, then we can bring that understanding to the public. Um, I think uh, the awareness about why we are having fires and how we can manage it and how science can have a role here together with you know uh, the practical communities fire response and management communities um, the public will be a part of the solution another question that has come in is some scientists recommend that no vegetation treatments after wildfires is the best approach i.e let nature take its course is doing nothing the best course to take? And any one of you can, can address this one. Rod, you want to take it or? So, so um, I, I think it's hard to put a one, you know, one answer fits all scenarios on this one. And some of the other people here can probably comment along that lines, but I think uh, in, a, in a, a low intensity wildfire scenario, I, I think, that's a that's a natural part of of the ecosystem and the ecosystem processes. So so uh, so there's not a whole lot of need. On the other hand, uh, we're in a situation where, due to fire suppression over a century, we're having many wildfires that are outside of the natural bounds, and so the response of the ecosystem is sometimes outside of the natural bounds. So. So in those scenarios, there might be need, whether it's erosion control or, um, or accelerating the, the rehabilitation of natural species as opposed to invasives. Um, it's not really my area of expertise, but I, I think it's a multiple, multiple scenarios, multiple different answers. Another question that uh, has come in that I think all of you can address What's the state of science modeling fire spread in the built environment of the wild and urban interface? Because so much of California is, uh, is built up and it adjoins the wildland. So what, what do we know about modeling of fire spread in, in these types of interfaces? So if, if no one else will, will jump in, I'll go ahead and jump in on that one. Okay. The, uh, it's a, if you're talking about movement of fire through the vegetation and the wildland urban interfaces, I think, um, I think there's, there's a lot of modeling that can address those issues. There's also a lot of modeling developed over many decades about structure fires. I think the juncture between the two is particularly difficult because the time scales and the processes that drive wildland fire are actually um, somewhat different than those that control the movement of fire within structures and the ignition of structure explicitly. So I think that juncture um, is, is a frontier, that there is collective knowledge. Um, Michael Gallner, for instance, has been, has been working on some stuff relatively that, to that. Um, but I think that there's there's an there's a big opportunity space there for working at that specific interface, and it's going to tie heavily to firebrand spread, firebrand lofting, and and fire started as well. 
Dira, you want to add something to this? Yeah, just that uh, in previous assessments, we sort of avoided putting, placing simulated fires in urbanized areas. And now uh, for the fifth assessment, we're modeling the whole state and allowing that to occur. And we're trying to model the probability of burning at high severity in those kinds of, of structures um, in, you know, say subject subdivisions adjacent to uh, vegetated areas. Um, the, the, the really big constraint is, is that we don't have access yet to the information the insurance companies have, for example, that describes the risk characteristics of those homes and how that may have mitigated or not uh, risk in prior years. And so there's a trove of data out there that could greatly improve our models that we haven't been able to tap into yet. So Leroy, you have the last word because we have just run out of time. I know there are many questions that our audience has put in and I think they're gonna organize a way for us to respond to all those questions that we couldn't get to uh, in our panels. So to conclude, I wanna thank all of you for a wonderful session highlighting role of data, modeling, machine learning, AI, and decision-making. So thank you all. And back to you, Teresa. Thank you, Pramod, and thank, thank you to all the speakers. The, the, the presentations were fantastic. Um, as Pramod said, the questions are pouring in. The questions are phenomenal, by the way, and uh, we will get to them. The question about uh, linkages with uh, Native American tribes. You're gonna hear a little bit about that right after the break in a couple of presentations, as well as comments on the wildland urban interface and other topics that were brought up in this session. So we are gonna take a five minute break and uh, start at 10 o'clock, probably 10.01 now. Um, so grab a, a cup of coffee and please come back for more excellent presentations. Thank you all.
Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we are going to continue the program uh, with uh, a presentation uh, to kick it off. Would is Vice Chancellor for Research Roger Wakamoto from UCLA. He is an atmospheric scientist spe specializing in research on mesoscale meteorology, particularly severe convection convective storms and radar meteorology. So Roger, please um, introduce the next speakers. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa. And it's a, it's a pleasure to talk to all of you about a topic that is so critical to the state of California. Just a couple introductory comments. We've clearly joined two other prominent communities that come to my mind, tornado season in the Midwest, hurricane season in the Southeast. When our state is on high alert and our residents truly fear what the wildfire season will bring in any given year. But you know, that, I really wanna highlight the fact that, that that means that this is not just a physical science challenge. It requires a lot uh, of knowledge about social sciences, why populations move to vulnerable areas, similar to people moving to coastal areas and hurricane prone regions, how the public reacts to warnings, both short and long-term warnings, and exactly how do they prepare. I'll just say that solving this problem requires the collective wisdom of everybody, and that this is at the very heart of the UC's mission to serve the public. So with that, I'd like to introduce our speakers for this session entitled Understanding Wildfire and its Impact to California, Speeding the Science to Solution Pathway. And I really wanna highlight that last part, speeding the science to solution pathway, because science alone isn't gonna help us. Uh, first, John Battles is a professor of forest ecology at UC Berkeley. He's a field scientist engaged in long-term research of temperate forest ecosystems. His goal is to understand how and why forests change. Toward this end, his research seeks to understand the dynamic response of forest communities to disturbances and perturbations such as air pollution, invasive species, forest management, extreme drought, and fire. His recent work has focused on understanding the interactions among disturbances in order to assess their potential to reshape forests. The other person is Alex Hall. He's a professor in the Department of Atmospheric and Oceanic Sciences and director of the UCLA Center for Climate Science. His research is aimed at predicting and understanding climate change impact at scales relevant to decision makers, especially in the state of California. Alex and his teams are currently studying the future of wildfire in California and are working with water management agencies in the Los Angeles region to ensure sustainability of water resources under climate change. Now, John and uh, Alex have been jointly working on this material, but in the interest of time, John will make the presentation, but Alex will be nearby because he'll join him during the Q&A period. So John, start out, the floor is yours. Okay. Uh, thank you, Professor Maldonado, for the invitation and Professor Wakamoto for the introduction. Um, today, I'm serving as a spokesman for a large group of scientists, many of whom are here today to describe a collective idea to make all of our research more helpful in addressing the wildfire problem. My collaborator, Professor Alex Hall from UCLA, is a leader of this effort and made major contributions to the ideas presented today. Our title screen features two classic California landscapes. Uh, a mixed conifer forest in El Dorado County and a Chamise Chaparral forest in Riverside County. They represent just two examples of the vast ecological diversity of our state. But like many other landscapes in, in California, they share a functional dependence on fire. Thus their future depends on understanding and managing the complex interactions of these communities with wildfire. And the nature of this future has tangible impacts on the health and well-being of all Californians. Climate plays a major role in shaping wildfire behavior and fire regimes. And climate is changing and will continue to change. We have documented increases in temperature and even under the most optimistic future conditions, temperature is going to increase through time. These consequences we've already begun to see in California, we, you know, we've heard about it today, the, the large increase in wildfires, the severity in areas burned in wildfires in the last decade, that this map from California Ecosystems Climate Solutions shows the fire footprints are shared widely across the state. And these maps of these big, these mega fires that shows the progression of these fires are also shared across the state. 
And thus our future is changing and we have to figure out how we manage wildfire in the climate ch the changing California climate future. What we have now, what we're seeing now is mega fires and hot droughts. Again, fires and droughts have been part of the California landscape for, for millennia, but we're seeing unique behavior, these exceptionally large fires and these, these droughts that are not only lower, low in precipitation are about, of also very warm. And these have consequences and these two consequences interact to, to shape our future. One of the problems is that the 2012 to 2016 drought was an extraordinarily hot drought. Again, it was an extended four year drought that was both low in precipitation with warm temperatures. It created extreme stress on many of the plant communities throughout the state. And we had this, it led to a massive wave of mortality among trees throughout the Sierra Nevada. And it was a combination of about both drought stress and then weakened trees with a bark beetle outbreak. The consequences for fire is that it created this huge influx of surface fuels at these dead trees falls. And we're monitoring these surface fuels and this huge increase in surface fuels across the state. And we've heard earlier today from Rod's talk about how important these surface fuels are and not just the magnitude of the fuels, but also the, the spatial distribution of those fuels. And the major concern, and we've seen some evidence of this in, in the creek fire, is that this new surface fuel load could actually create new fire behavior, fire behavior we haven't seen before, where we have these large, massive, heavy fuels that burn for days and potentially create new kinds of fire physics. And this is you know, worrisome in that we don't even know how to model this kind of fire behavior because we haven't seen it before. So this is an effort we're actively working on how does this drought mortality it, you know, intersect the fire regime by its impact on the fuels. Another major challenge is that we know that dry offshore winds are ideal conditions for these massive fires. We need to understand these, these wind conditions, this, this, this fire weather conditions that clearly drive their behavior. And so we're trying to model these, this, this work going on and how we can predict it so we can be proactive in, in, in response to wildfire risks. So, but a major gap is, can we predict these large fires, these, these winds that drive large fires? Now, work coming out of the California Ecosystem Futures Project, which is a UC Lab Fees funded project, you know, they can simulate these winds and they're having a lot of success in simulating the winds. The animation you're seeing is, is a projection around in November of 2018 and the prelude to the Wolseley Fire in Southern California. And you see these two patterns where you see the brown is showing huge decreases, low, by, low relative humidity and these onshore winds. And you get this combination, as we, we heard earlier today, of, of high winds and low relative humidity. That's a recipe for a large fire. So we need to be able to predict these, but there's challenges remaining. You know, we need to get the fine scale topographic effects because that's, that's where fire weather happens. It doesn't happen at the big scale. We need to know the fire itself will influence these winds. So we have both the, the atmospheric driven winds and then the fire driven winds going on. And so this uncertainty of, wild, of wind behavior is also gonna change as climate change. So we need to keep pace with the changes in climate. Another problem, the challenge we have is that after these mega fires, there's, there's complex vegetation dynamics after these fires. And, and I focus on forests, so those are the examples I pick, but we have the same problem in Chaparral. If we have too frequent or too much fire, we have the potential to shift forest to shrublands, or we have the potential to shift chaparral to grasslands. These type conversions are extraordinary. These are step changes in how our ecosystems work with consequences on our water regime, on our biodiversity, and on our climate storage, on our carbon storage. So one of the challenges is, can we predict the complex vegetation dynamics that comes after when we, we have these, again, massive fires that kill large swaths of the forest and the shrubs come up and how does this succession from trees to shrub work? Will it be delayed? Will it never happen? We need to figure this out under the new, the new scenario. And so again, the whole goal is, we also know going forward, the climate is gonna to continue to change. So this is some work coming out of the Climate Change and Ecosystem Dynamics Lab. You know, can we get our fire vegetation models to account for the pace of climate change. This is some of their early work where they're looking at how we have a, a mix of, of pine and cedar under different future conditions with, with fire and without fire. These are the kind of predictive models that, are, that again, are, are necessary, but still you know, need research to, to move forward and then move from research to help solutions. These, these knowledge gaps also have huge policy implications. These policy challenges go along with this information challenges. And one of the big ones is that we know like, who gets the smoke. We know that wildfire regional emissions, these, these, are the worst these are the worst option. These are what happens. It creates widespread 
regional emissions that have health consequences for both nearby communities and very distant communities. And so we have alternatives, these fuel reduction treatments that help mitigate some of it, help mitigate the risk of wildfire, but these treatments have also consequences. You know, mechanical treatments, mastication treatments, these are, these are relatively expensive, these are expensive treatments economically, um, but they limit emissions. And so there's a value there. Where on the other hand, prescribed fire has to play a role. Uh, prescribed fire is, is relatively economical compared to mechanical treatments and reducing fuel loads and reducing fire hazard. And yet they do create local emissions for the local communities. And so a big part of how California addresses its challenges with climate change and wildfire is that environmental justice is a guiding principle to response to climate change. So we have to think of policy solutions that protect the lands and the communities associated with those lands. Another policy challenge is how do we balance fuel reduction treatments that we so desperately need across the state with another goal is to preserve biodiversity. We have the wildfire and forest resilience action plan that comes out. And we also have the 30 for 30 plan that comes out from the state where 30% of the area of the state needs to, you know, by, to preserve the bio biodiversity by 2030. So we have these competing demands and we see these interacting in the chaparral where we have two kinds of fuel treatments. We have prescribed fire and we have again, mastication and again, these have effects on how you know, they, have, they reduce fuels, but they have different effects on the biodiversity, where prescribed fire seems to preserve biodiversity better in terms of birds, where the mastication seems to reduce the diversity and also change the composition of the bird community. So how do we balance these? These are, these are decisions that are really policy decisions. And when we get the information, how does that translate to policy? Of course, another policy challenge, a huge policy challenge is how to protect the wildland inter inter interface from wildfire. How do we protect these communities right on the edge here, these, these interface zones that are bordering, you know, homes that are bordering sort of the, the, the wildland interface. And there's, you know, some options are really sort of are, are obvious and, and, and beneficial. For example, home hardening and financial support from the state to harden people's homes to wildfire risk is, is just seems like a, a low hanging solution, a low hanging fruit solution. Other solutions are more problematic. You get into land use development questions. And so then these are much more controversial as where you can build and when you can build. Those are much more conversion, you know, much more difficult uh, uh, options to think about. A third problem, again, some of them are not even, are outside the state's purview in terms of third parties, like what insurance companies do are gonna be really important to where you build and who builds and how you build in the wildland interface. So we need to think about these kinds of questions. One of the problems that we have, certainly in the environmental field, is that we're still sort of following traditional passive science pathway. Certainly at UC, we do a lot of basic research and we're also committed to applied research. But then these next steps are much more difficult. You need to take that research and get it into a tech transfer. And so, so you get a tool out there and that happens sometimes, but not always. And then that tool needs to go out to the decision support, to the people actually making decisions on the ground in, in, a, in a form and a format that's useful for them to make decisions. And this does happen, um, but not always. And it takes a long time because we have this, this linear sequence because they do happen in this order. And what we're suggesting, and many of the scientists that we came together is that what we were thinking, what we really needed was to accelerate this, 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 this science to solution. Um, we need to speed the pathway. We need to pull together and kind of speed that pathway. And there's still a, a, a tip, a, an a, a sequence you have to follow. You have to have the basic research, but you don't wait till the basic research before you start the applied research. You start building on the applied research. You start thinking about the tech transfer and the decision support, you know, sort of in, in, in simultaneously. The idea is that you have the decisions, the people who are going to be using the ground information, helping shape the research. And you iterate much more, much more quickly this way with this dedicated approach. And so when you get a decision support, we know that that's not going to be the final answer, that information is going to get better, understanding is going to get better. And so then we can you know, restart the process in this adaptive management approach where we keep speeding it up. And so in a 10-year cycle, we don't get one solution. We've gone through it three, three times. And, and accelerate that kind of learning and that kind of implementation, because that's what climate change is forcing us to do. We can never sit pat and say, oh, we understand it, because climate is going to continue to change in, in the next few decades, no matter what we do. So we need to have that accelerated pathway. So what we've been talking about is this, what we're calling the Climate and Wildfire Institute. We, we, it's a 503, 5013C nonprofit boundary organization where we seek to build on certain fill the gaps that's happening right now in the huge investment in climate and wildfire research throughout California and throughout the, the nation. And we focus on convening policy and decision-making research as a service and a solution. We try to uh, speed science and technology transfer. And then of course, we, we keep this as, all as an open digital infrastructure. Everything is open access for people to share and use 
um, as they see fit. Now I wanted to step back a bit to talk about, again, when you put wildfire and climate together, as you've heard today, it, it's, it is complex connections. Just wildfire itself is complex connections. You start, you know, it goes from a time scale from seconds to decades and a temporal scale from meters squared to hundreds of squared kilometers. And we have different aspects of science focused on that. We think of the fire triangle and we have a fire triangle for fire physics. We have a fire triangle for wildfire behavior and we have a, well, a, a fire triangle for fire regimes. And these all are complex in them on themselves. And they also interact across these, space, these scales of space and time. And how they interact has implications for policy and management. And policy and management affect wildfire regimes and wildfire behavior. So how do we, how do we deal with these connections? So one of the priorities for the, for the Climate and Wildfire Institute is to make these connections. And so I'm showing an example from understanding wildfire behavior. We have this conceptual model of the fire triangle. And we have a lot of knowledge going on. We have big understanding of what's going on with fire weather, big understanding of the range of, of fuels, how that affects on topography, but there's gaps and we, we lack the connections. And so the whole focus on the CWI would be to make these connections so we have an operational model. Another connection is that we have to build capacity by co-developing knowledge. We don't bring this to the end and say, here it is, how are you gonna use it? We bring the co-developers in at the very beginning. We rely on the indigenous tribes that have millennia of experience managing the landscape. Under, you know, learn from the traditional ecological knowledge, learn from the communities out there who are actually doing prescribed fires. How, how, do they, how does that operate? What kind of information do they need? You know, talk to the different, you know, from, from resource conservation districts to the forest service to the national park service. Let's talk to the people who are actually managing the landscape and what they need and how, you know, what, do they, what do they need to do their job better. Bring them in at the beginning. And lastly, we have to understand that California is a diverse state. We have to address regional challenges and regional needs. We're incredibly ecologically diverse across the state. One thing we share, as I mentioned earlier, is wildfire has it across many of our ecological communities. All this red area is a high extreme wildfire hazard. But each of these regions also has a different historical uh, societies and, and current societies. And these regional groups need to come together to find regional solution challenges and regional needs. And that, that's one of the goals. There's no one size fits all for the state of California. Um, so thanks for listening and I'll open it up to questions now. Thank you so much, uh, John. And, and of course, Alex, because I know Alex prepared materials for this presentation. So let me um, start with what, toward the end of your presentation about the solutions part. Suppose I'm, I'm an emergency manager. And can you give me a little bit more insight about how these all these research results are, are actually going to help people with boots on the ground, either in two time frames, either in terms of preparedness or as the fire is raging? Can you give us at least a little insight? Although I know that's your end goal, but can you give us a little insight? Well, I could take one part of it. So for example, um, one of the one of the goals is to be able to, I think you saw it earlier, is to be able to predict where the wildfire is when you have an active wildfire where is it gonna burn, right? Where is it gonna burn and trying to predict that. And so you can both deploy for suppression and, and also public safety. And we just need to get better at that. That's, that has a, you know, all these intersections of understanding winds, of understanding the fuels and understanding again, sort of the basic fire models, like our, our models need to get better to be able to predict that. And so that would be, you know, that's one goal for, you know, and it needs to be in a format where you have a, a fire captain on the ground is able to use that information on his cell phone or on his tablet um, to make those kind of those kind of decisions. I don't know if you had another example, Alex. I was just going to jump in and say, you know, prediction on, on all time scales. Um, you know, obviously the climate change time scale is critical, and we already, um, you know, Lee Ray Westler talked about that earlier. Um, and I think there's more to do in that in that realm. Um, getting getting the vegetation modeling incorporated and the fire modeling incorporated dynamically, I think, is a, is a part of that. Um, and then, you know, I think that the seasonal time scale is a, is also an opportunity. Um, where I think there's probably predictive skill if we do a better job with modeling and, and um, really um, capitalize on seasonal um, predictability better. So I think that's another example of a, of a um, scientific you know, development that could ultimately enable better decision making. Okay, great, thank you so much. Uh, you know, we always talk right now about California. Um, it is a West Coast problem, but Talk a little bit more about the, the, what you touched on at the very beginning of your talk about this regional problem. Some people would argue it's global, 
Because once the smoke plume goes, I mean, it really goes. It goes all the way across the U.S., crosses the ocean. Uh, do you have any insights in, in, about that in terms of either climate issues or health issues? Well, certainly this is a problem served across, you know, the, I mean, I think the initial focus is, 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 is beyond California, you know, is, is California, Nevada focus. But we want to build for the arid west North, of North America. These are problems that are shared from the Rockies and, and you know, all the way up through British Columbia and Alberta. Um, and so these are, and then we out, and you go to the Southwest, these are shared, they're different, um, but you know, climate change is gonna warm and it's gonna, these are shared challenges that we have to build on. And then globally, we all share Mediterranean climate. So a lot of what we do is, is applicable to Chile and to Australia um, and to much of Europe um, in terms of the challenges we're facing. And so we see some of it as being, you know, California as an instigator of these kinds of changes. I think particularly Australia is facing um, a very, very similar situation. Um, and I think there's a lot to be learned from um, engaging with them um, and, and understanding how they're approaching these issues as well. Okay, uh, we have an interesting question, which I'll try to rephrase uh, in terms of what I think they're trying to say is, based on all these presentations we've heard today, are, are we talking about building this super model <laughs> that has various parts that we uh, users can use or, or are we talking about something else? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good question. Let me get that one around. Uh, Alex, take a first crack at that one. Yeah, I, I do think that, um, I don't know what, what you want to call it, but I do think the, there is a need for a lot of investment in modeling infrastructure, um, especially model integration. There, there, we've already seen some fantastic modeling, um, um, you know, today um, in, in the presentations that were done earlier. Um, but I, I do think that there's a, um, a need for integration and, and kind of California um, specific modeling, um, you know, just because of the unique vegetation types that we have here in the state um, and the unique fire regimes that we have. Um, and so I, I think that there, I think that yes, we do need a, um, an, an integrated modeling system um, that is, um, that it, that is, is usable by a very, um, wide, wide and diverse range of, of research communities. And I'll just add, you know, like a lot of what the CWI envisions doing is a lot of the, sort of the boring infrastructure work because to, to support those models, you need to support the data streams that, that those models are built on. And a lot of times we have these big projects and big investments um, and they create useful products, and the, but if they don't become part of a private sector for profit type enterprise, they, they sometimes aren't maintained. And that just seems like a, a huge waste of resources. So if we have an effective product and we build these models, we need to make sure those data streams are maintained. And that's one of the things we see that the CDOI can do. That's not a great thing for the university to do, uh, but that's something that this, this institute could take on and say, we need to continue this because this is a valuable data stream and, and it will keep it going. So I think some of that, just that infrastructure, that nuts and bolts infrastructure that keeps those connections, because you could have a great model, but if your data stream degrades, the model is no good anymore. And you know, Roger, you, you were um, because of your leadership role at NCAR and NSF. This might this might resonate with you. You know, I think that there's a need for something like NCAR, um, but but for climate and wildfire, um, where where there's there's some inst institution that takes responsibility for the uh, for the tool development, um, like like John was saying. Yeah, make a community model that's open access that anyone can use and download, which yep. is part of the strengths. Uh, NCAR, by the way, stands for the National Center for atmospheric research for those who don't know. Um, can you tell, each of you tell us what you think is really the big black hole in terms of what's impeding progress in what you're trying to do? Just name one. I just, like, I think you mentioned earlier that a lot of these groups are, are collaborating on an ad hoc and because it's, it's manner. We just want to institute, we want to sort of make that institutionalize that and support it. It's, a, it's an add-on support. It's just, we need that, keep products going, you know, have a place that the whole goal of the organization is to make the connections. And that's, that those are, those are right now are on ad hoc basis. And we want to try, try to make that more, more, more formal. And, you know, I, I think just listening to the presentations earlier, I, I'm just so impressed by what's happening um, in terms of individual researchers and what they're doing. Um, and we've just made so much progress um, in, in this field um, so quickly, um, and yet it is insufficient. Um, you know, I, I think that, that, the, um, that we, 
you know, when, when, the, when projects and, and, and researchers move, move on, um, you know, we, we, we lose a lot of those threads. And um, there, again, there's just this need for um, someone to take responsibility for um, sustaining research and, and, and identifying the, the most important threads, keeping them alive, um, identifying new, you know, new opportunities that need, need to be um, pursued and you know, making sure that, that those actually are, are happening. Um, that it's not just up to individual researcher initiative, that there's somebody taking responsibility for the overall research strategy. Um, so I think, I think that um, while there's great stuff happening, it just seems like we, we're, we're just not quite meeting the, the scale of the challenge. Okay, I see we're heading to the end so quickly. Uh, you have a captive audience. What is the most important takeaway message you'd like to leave with them? Go well, first, Alex. Okay. Um, well, you know, I guess I, I would just go back to, um, you know, what I said a moment ago about what, what amazing things are happening. And, and I, you know, I think um, UCOP can take a lot of credit um, for catalyzing um, some really great interdisciplinary projects. I um, had the privilege to be part of one of those projects, one of the lab fees funded projects. And, um, and we, we, we did, um, we have been creating a community. Um, and that, that is, I think, pretty new and has developed over the past three years or so. Um, and I, I think that's really been a necessary enabling step um, to think more deeply about the um, climate and wildfire challenge. And, um, and so I guess, you know, I, I, I do want to go back and emphasize the, the, the full part of the glass, <laughs> um, which is the, the great work that's, that's being done. Um, and again, you know, I just think they're, 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 we, now we need to take, take this to the next level. Okay. John, quickly. Yeah, I, I would just add that it's, you know, so many scientists coming together who are often criticized for just focusing on their basic research and not caring about, you know, whether it makes a difference or not. I think there's been a huge, you know, just the problem is so urgent that there's just a huge collection of scientists who, who want their research to make a difference. And they're willing to put effort into doing that last part. And I think that's the difference. It's part of our public mission, certainly as UC scientists to do that. I think we're embracing it, um, you know, grabbing it and trying to do it as best we can. Wonderful way to end the session. Thank you both so much. I turn it over to Teresa. Thank you so much, Roger, Alex, and John. Very compelling remarks. Um, I think you, you identified the scope of some of my role at the UC system. Thank you so much. And I'm eager to follow up with you with more discussions. So to the audience, you can hear the hunger of our researchers to scale their work and integrate it to have more meaningful large scale impact to society. So uh, thank you. Our next presentation will be kicked off by Dr. Rodolfo Torres, who is the Vice Chancellor for Research and Economic Development at the University of California at Riverside. He is also a distinguished professor in mathematics. Rodolfo. Uh, thank you, Teresa, um, for, the, for the opportunity to be here today. And thank you to all the, the speakers so far and uh, an impressive list, a uh, number of uh, participants in the audience that I can see. What a fantastic morning. Um, I, I want to remark, as, as some of echo some of my uh, colleague BCR has said, uh, I think we are seeing the, the relevance of the power of all the campuses and the national lab working together, uh, how the synergy that Cal the University of California bring to address this important problem, not, not just for our state, but also for the nation and the world. Um, and we see in, in this the, the relevance of all the areas of research and scholarly work. And so certainly cannot be absent from there, agriculture and natural resources, uh, such, which has such a tradition within uh, the UC system in terms of research and innovation. So it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Hamilton, Glenda Hamilton. She's the vice president for the UC Agriculture and Natural Resources. Um, she came in 2015 to UC with more than 25 years of experience working on public policy development and program implementation supporting sustainability. Born in California and with two degrees from the University of California, a master from uh, Davis in agriculture, international agriculture, development PhD from Berkeley in environmental science policy and management. 
Uh, Dr. Hamilton has a broad range of experience and leadership positions. Among many of the roles she has held, she served uh, as a Peace Corps volunteer in Tunisia, as an executive director of a nonprofit organization advocating farmland preservation, and as a consultant on environmental and agricultural issues through the West. She was deputy undersecretary for natural resources and environment at the US Department of Agriculture during President, President Clinton's administration and was appointed by President Obama to serve as a California state director at the USDA Rural Development. Dr. Hamilton is also uh, leading and has led a lot of effort to bring rural issues to the forefront of the state economic summit and policy making throughout California. She will talk today about moving toward resilience in California and FL. I understand not only how to help prevent fire, but also in the process how to contribute to the economy and even have uh, improve our quality of life. Uh, Vice President Hamilton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for that introduction. I appreciate that. And I'm uh, really thrilled to be here this morning with folks. Uh, this has been a great uh, summit so far. I've, I've really enjoyed all the previous speakers. And what I'm going to do is kind of change it up a little bit. Uh, UC a &R, we, we have a lot of folks working on much of the same research that you heard earlier. But the other avenue that we work on is actually uh, getting that research out into the field and working with a wide array of partners, local, state, federal government, private sector partners, NGOs, economic development organizations, and others to try to actually, as, as the title says, empower resilient and productive landscapes, uh, seeking those opportunities for really the triple bottom line, people, planet, prosperity. And if we start with looking at the planet, first of all, we're really looking at ultimately a healthy forest. That's what a lot of us want. We're, we're trying to deal with the issues we've had for over 100 years of fire regimes that have created a lot of issues, drought, pests, diseases, uh, overgrown. That We've got a lot of unhealthy forests out there. And that leads to a lot of problems. Uh, if we had healthy forests, there are immense benefits from those. First of all, just the savings from avoiding fire. It's estimated that the 2018 California fires are probably ultimately gonna cost the state over $300 billion when you factor in long-term health costs, long-term effects to the economy. It, it's not just that initial 10 or 20 billion you see in lost structures. There's ongoing issues as well as the loss of ecosystem services. And that's something healthy forests really do support is a lot of ecosystem services, not the least of which our Sierra and Cascades could be producing anywhere from nine to 16% more water if they were in a healthy state. And they support an extremely large economic sector, the outdoor recreation, which has been estimated at over 92 billion a year and a lot of jobs, particularly in some very uh, far flung rural communities that need those jobs. In addition to that, we've just got to get people understanding uh, what they need to do on their own homes. Uh, one of the best articles for a layperson who, who may be having a hard time understanding some of the research was put in the SAC B in 2019, and they actually updated it just this past summer with some new information where they really looked at, okay, what does this mean for community? What's going on some of the future? I, I really urge folks to look at this. It's a several part series worth looking at. As part of our efforts, uh, UCANR co-chairs an activity that has been going on for several years as part of the California State Economic Summit. We co-chair that with RCRC, uh, which is the statewide organization of rural counties supervisors. And in this, we've really focused on this idea of working landscapes, resilient landscapes, uh, ecosystem services, and in particular, thanks to some other recent work, the idea of how we could combine healthy forests and all those ecosystem benefits with economic development and jobs creation. This is a report that we put out in 2019 that we're still utilizing as we implement various initiatives and programs. But the key goal there was to try to move the state to treating at least, and, and let's underline that, at least one million acres a year. We probably need to treat more but at least that 
by linking that expanded forest management with a new wood products industry that converts that biomass into biofuels, bioproducts, and other innovative uses. It, it, at the end of the day, I and many others feel there is not enough public money to do the work we need to do to have healthy forests, gain those ecosystem services, reduce fire. There's just not from the federal or state or local government combined enough money. We've got to find highly valued uses for that biomass so that we can then have that as an incentive to get that biomass out of the forest. And that's been a challenge. Uh, to help us with that, the state legislature a few years ago, uh, SB 859, created uh, an effort to look at how do we set up a wood products industry here in California. They produced a report from their working group. And since then, there's been a great deal of activity. There have been changes to the building codes here in California to allow for advanced wood products. We've now had a couple of mass timber building competitions. We've got community colleges working on workforce development. We've got all of the system working on how to organize many of these initiatives. And in particular, one of the things called out that you see as response, wait a minute, before I get to that, let me make sure folks understand what I'm talking about when I talk about advanced wood products, because you're, you're used to burning up biomass for electricity. That's something we've done for, for a couple of decades now. But the problem with that is it's not economically viable without large subsidies. It just cannot compete with wind or solar and certainly not with natural gas. But there are a lot of other uses beyond that. There's liquid biofuels. There's cellulosic nanofibers, actually one of my favorite options. Uh, advanced wood products of all sorts, bio-based plastics, et cetera. This is the kind of thing we're looking for. How do we facilitate the best way to utilize our biomass in California, get it out of those forests in an, in an environmentally sustainable manner and get it into these products and into the market? Um, this is critical. This is something that uh, we have a lot of folks around the state working on. I was at a meeting down in San Jose a few years ago when uh, the mayor, Sam Licardo, made this statement that made me perk up instantly when he said, CLT will save the world. I mean, that's something I've been saying for a while, and I know a few other people were, but I was really shocked to hear the San Jose mayor said that. But the reality is some of our cities are really starting to make use of these products because even though they're still a tad bit more expensive, the, the product is, the savings in labor and the reduced time to build these. And the beauty of these is just these buildings utilizing these products are just unbelievable. And then when you throw in the fact that they're actually more energy efficient, just as safe in a fire, better in an earthquake, and they sequester carbon, it's like a win-win-win, something that as a state, we've got to move to. And fortunately, many communities are. In fact, here's a couple examples just to give you a sense of what's going on around the world. Most of the world is far ahead of us in this. Uh, Canada and Europe in particular have been utilizing these materials for over a decade now. And in recent years, Washington State and Oregon have enacted legislation to not just push these, encourage these, but require them in public buildings. Something that I personally and many others along with me are urging the state legislature here in California to consider doing. Uh, we do have some great buildings going up in California. These are a few examples over in Sacramento, San Francisco. And as you can see, these are, these are really beautiful buildings. And as I said, just as safe, if not safer in many ways than traditional construction methods. And California now allows up to 18 stories using these materials. But how are we gonna get there? Because the problem right now is we don't have the infrastructure, the supply chains or the manufacturing footprint to actually get that biomass in California manufactured in California into buildings in California or into other products. What we're proposing and working on as part of that state economic summit effort is that we really as a state look at uh, putting up on existing industrial sites in the Sierra. We've got hundreds of existing sites that were abandoned sawmills, old abandoned biomass plants, some that are used but underutilized. Utilize those to do some initial pre-processing. 
The problem with biomass, it's big, bulky, and heavy. It costs a fortune to transport at any distance. Usually anything over 30, 40 miles just makes anything uh, uneconomical right off the bat. But if we could do that first couple stages of pre-processing, initial breakdown, uh, then transport it further down into the valley floor or further where we've got larger sites available, but also access to railroad, highways, ports of Stockton, that kind of thing. Uh, do manufacturing there so that we can then get it into markets. And as you can see, this is the kind of thing that as a state, we really can do a large scale economic development initiative for. And this is happening in certain regions. Certain regions are looking at exactly this. And just something that gives all of us hope, recently, uh, RCRC, our partner at the State Economic Summit, established their own public benefit nonprofit corporation called Golden State Natural Resources to facilitate exactly this activity. They have now done what we need to do many, many more times, dozens of times, if not hundreds. They've went in and literally built an entire supply chain. They've got an agreement with the Forest Service for access to the biomass. They've made arrangements to get that biomass to a manufacturing site. They're manufacturing high grade wood pellets that are then going to Japan and South Korea who are utilizing those as part of their interim process to move off of nuclear onto other more sustainable sources of energy. It's not a permanent solution, but it's a great solution for the next five to 10 years, wood pellets. But we could be utilizing this same type of supply chain building from start to finish to market in many other parts of the state. And that is something we're urging and working with regional organizations to do. Uh, these are just a few examples of some of the folks in the California Stewardship Network who are working on this initiative. The Stewardship Network, along with California Forward and entities like UC, CSU, and many, many other partners, are, are co-hosts and active leaders in the annual State Economic Summit every year. Uh, these different regional organizations belong to the Stewardship Network because they have signed on to the concept of triple bottom line economic development, something that is good for the people, the planet, and general prosperity, something that I, I feel very passionately about and I think offers us some of the best hope. With these kind of partners, we can go out into regions and bring our research, our UC research, all of our various systems and help make these kind of things happen. The other thing we're also doing uh, as part of SB 859 that I mentioned earlier, we have a joint wood products innovation institute. Uh, this is something we do jointly with the CSU system and the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection. And what that institute does is it facilitates uh, ide identification of the best research. It helps facilitate getting funding to that, putting together multidisciplinary efforts, forming collaborations, and, and getting that information out and helping get that research where it needs to go for commercialization. Really critical activities. One example I'll share is something from UC Merced. Uh, I love some of the stuff their School of Engineering is doing, in particular things like finding manufacturing technologies to enable small scale manufacturing. This is something critically important to small communities up in the Sierra who want to see those jobs and economic development be part of their community. But new ways to use that, that uh, biomass and things like home building blocks. We've all seen cinder blocks in homes. Well, think about having those made out of biomass. Uh, Merced's partnering with companies such as this one out of Australia on several new different ways to uh, put together building materials that exceed code and, and are act strongly acting on load bearing external walls. Um, one of the things we're doing, my division, uh, Cooperative Extension, We've got folks out in every single county that provide a bridge from UC research on the campuses, as well as our research extension centers to get that into the county, work with the local people. And we're also making use of our volunteers to educate the public on how to interact with all the stuff you've seen before as well as what I'm presenting right now. For example, our master gardeners have ended up being one of the best education vehicles to get homeowners to understand the need to put in fire resistant landscaping and also to carry the message on the need for fire home hardening and, and fire prevention activities. 
Uh, our 4 H kids, believe it or not, are actually jumping on the bandwagon too. They're out there working with communities to understand the needs of fire prevention, home hardening, and to actually start doing more community participatory science to help our researchers get the data and information they need even more rapidly. Um, one of the things as I close that's really critically important here is what can the UC system do? And this is something we've discussed in the uh, Global Climate Leaders Council for the UC system for a couple of years now and, and are working at trying to facilitate is having the University of California system really take a strong leadership role in being that market for these advanced wood products. The UC system is big enough that as a market, it could help us get supply chains and manufacturing going much quicker than just the normal market activity would allow. So this fits in really well with our goal to be carbon neutral. It fits in with our goal to be a contributing part of the California economy, as well as just the health and welfare of our California citizens. So in closing, I just wanna say, I think we've got some very exciting opportunities here to tie our research, our extension, our efforts in the field, our collaborative community engagement activities with this type of statewide initiative to have those healthy forests, uh, improve wildlife habitat, recreation, water, all those good ecosystem services, jobs, economic development, buildings that are better in a fire, an earthquake, sequester carbon. One of the reasons I'm so excited about this is I have rarely in my professional career had the opportunity to work on something that has this many win, 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 wins. I don't know how anybody can resist working with us on it. So I'll stop there and uh, would love to entertain some questions. And let me stop sharing my screen. Okay. Well, thank you very much for a very thought provoking presentation. And we received a lot of questions already from the audience. Let me start with this one. Um, uh, you talk a lot about uh, healthy forests. Could you define what you mean by healthy versus unhealthy forests? And what about other, uh, you know, management of other uh, ecosystems like chaparrals, or woodlands, uh, grasslands, et cetera? Well, I think what I mean by healthy and many other folks is something that more mimics what would be naturally occurring uh, if mother nature was left up to her own devices. And, and the problem we have with our forests now is that for almost a hundred years, we have, we have practiced fire suppression in our forests that has caused them to not appear like they would naturally appear. If you look at pictures and get oral histories of forests from a hundred plus years ago, there's much less overgrowth, undergrowth. There, there's trees more spaced out apart. And also in addition to that, we've got a lot of invasive species that uh, have moved into our forest, some of which are highly flammable. So basically a healthy forest is one that probably would have looked like it looked 150 years ago. And if we had that, um, as I said, we, we would be getting so many more ecosystem service benefits out of it than we currently do. And, and, and as far as other vegetation types, same answer, something that is a healthy uh, ecosystem that, that, you know, the flora, the fauna, the water, all the different met aspects of the ecosystem are in a healthy balance. All right. But there are several questions, certainly uh, very thought provoking the idea to change material for construction and so on, something we haven't done so much so far. And I, I see why many people have questions related to that. For example, could you discuss how increased uh, construction, say for housing in the wildland urban interface could actually increase fire rates? How construction in the wildland interface could increase fire risk? Yeah, that's a, that's a question. Well, currently- Or, or if it would increase, if, I guess it would be if. Well, okay, so currently we do have a lot of homes in the WUI, the wildlife urban interface it's called, um, who have been built in the past with, with quite a lack of planning, actually, that um, are, are, are at risk. They're, they're out in the forest. It's extremely hard for firefighters to protect those structures. And all too often, because we are trying to protect those structures, wildfires get away from efforts to contain them and grow larger uh, than they might have. 
Um, and, and just, of course, enormous loss of both property and people when that occurs. One of the things we really need to do going forward is be smarter about our land use planning. We, we need to really think about where we are allowing houses to be built in the WUI. We also need to have existing homes do the kind of home hardening that would make them safer in a fire. You know, get, get vegetation back, make sure you don't have wood shingles. I would hope to cry it out loud, nobody in California has wood shingles on their house anymore in this day and age, but I think some do. You know, get fire resistant shingles, get uh, vents in your attic so that they are fire resistant. It's embers that get into an attic that just will instantly get to send a house up. Um, do that home hardening activities. We've got a lot of stuff on our website for homeowners on how to do that. But also, we've also helped homeowners uh, organize control burn associations. That's something people could do too, where they've already got homes to make sure that they've got some, some controlled burn around them to reduce that fuel load. There's many, many other things, but uh, we've got a lot of sources out there. And call, contact any of our county offices and they'll connect you with people who will come and help you figure out what you need to do in your community. So also related to construction, are, are is, uh, the UC system or some of the other uh, California State University or other government uh, units are really using cross-laminated timber product for new buildings? And mm -hmm. how much of that is going on in the state? Actually, it's, it's a rapidly growing sector in the state. Uh, the legislation I mentioned earlier, SB 859, encouraged, strongly encouraged, public entities to utilize these materials. Now, as I said, Washington state has already jumped past that and they're requiring it in public buildings, something California needs to consider. But as the materials become more available, as the cost of the materials go down, especially right now, as the cost of just plain old lumber is skyrocketing, um, the, these, these materials are becoming much more cost effective. And then when you tack into that, the labor savings, uh, they're becoming very attractive. The trick is going to be if we can manufacture a lot of those materials here in California so that you reduce the transportation cost of both the biomass to the manufacturing and then the manufactured goods into the final product. Because that, that is what uh, does add quite a bit of cost to the whole thing right now. So related to that, I'm, I'm curious, and, and perhaps there is already, are there any incentive for uh, builders or, or organization to use this material in the sense, you know, if if I buy an electric car, I get a rebate on, on my stay on my tax return. Uh, is there something like that uh, in place or thought about uh, implementing something like that for this type of construction? To the best of my knowledge, there's nothing like that um, uh, authorized in, in law right now. But I do know there are several legislative offices discussing that as options moving forward to help move this industry forward and help get this manufacturing base started up. So what, what can we do as, as just uh, individuals, right? I mean, we, some of us like to go to Home Depot or other places yeah. and, and uh, try to improve our home or build what, you, you know, yeah. any individual can do this. I mean, I just went through a massive remodel of my own home a couple of years ago, and I was able to utilize four different advanced wood products. I have a giant glue lamb beam. I've got OSB, I've got CLT, and I've got LVLs. And, and don't ask me to actually say what those initials stand for, but they're all advanced wood products. And I've got them throughout my home. It was not hard to get a hold of them. When I redid my de deck, I did a fire resistant Trex product that utilizes biomass and, and other products. Um, you know, Vulcan Vents, uh, not, not to say they're the only one out there, but that's the one I utilize. But there's some companies that have the kind of vents that keep embers out of your attic. Any individual can do that. These products are not hard to get your hands on. Home Depot has some of them, but frankly, your local Ace Hardware, your local lumber yard probably has them as well. And I always encourage people to buy local myself. <laughs> Good, good, good advice. Uh, do you think that integrating government decision making and moving away from the silos that currently exist is needed to make good decision about forest, climate, etc.? If so, what is being done to facilitate this integration? Yeah, the, SB 859 is a perfect example of taking some baby steps towards that. You know, the reality is for much of our um, economy, we do not usually calculate 
the opportunity costs. We, we don't calculate the unintended consequences of the materials or the actions we take. So, you know, the cost of uh, greenhouse gases from production of concrete, for example, the cost of steel. I mean, all of those have costs associated with them to the environment, but typically that cost does not show up in the price. And that's one of the things government can do. It can start looking at what is the overall triple bottom line of products, manufacturing, distribution. How do we make sure we're getting cost-effective materials to the industry, to homeowners, but at the same time, making sure that those costs aren't unnecessarily costing our environment and our ecosystem? And uh, I guess because of the time, maybe this will be the last question and then I will allow you for a fi some final comment. Um, there are several questions about um, what is the UC system uh, doing to support the technology transfer, uh, both in, in the kind of material described or any other of the technology innovation that current care in any of the research being done about uh, wildfire uh, prevention and forest management? That's a great question, and, and it's a perfect setup for me to hand it off to Teresa in a moment, because I'm sure she's got a great answer to that. Um, all of our campuses have a technology transfer office, and, and they do great work. In particular, they're now working more and more with private sector. As, as a university system, one of the things our regents have taken on this past year is to really look at how we can improve commercialization uh, and public-private partnerships towards that. And I think you're gonna see more and more of that moving forward that's really positive. I think the other thing is such examples such as I showed UC Merced doing. They're working with the private sector now. And one of the things I love, if you guys ever get a chance, that, that engineering school at Merced has a capstone project for their students to look at how they can do new exciting products out of biomass. And I gotta tell you, I love watching college students when they're being that creative. Berkeley does something similar. I think Irvine might as well. We got a lot of that kind of thing going on. And that's how UC is gonna help get our research into usable, practical, both materials, processes, and solutions to these challenges we're facing. And Teresa, I, I know you didn't pay me, but that was a great set. <laughs> That was beautifully stated. <laughs> Thank, okay. you. Thank you. Thank you again, Vice President Hamilton and Teresa. I pass back to you. Oh, thank you so much, Rodolfo. Glenda, fantastic as usual. Thank you so much. And now to our final session. It will be moderated by Dr. Prasant Mohapatra, who is the Vice Chancellor for Research at the University of California at Davis. And he is a distinguished professor in the Department of Computer Science. Prasant. Thanks, uh, Vice President Maldonado. Uh, it's certainly my pleasure to be in here. And this has been such a learning experience this morning. Uh, great symposium, lots of new things to learn, lots of thoughts to be uh, pursued upon. And we can also think about some action items along these thoughts. It is my pleasure to moderate the second panel, which uh, is titled as Drought Impacts on Forest and Expected Wildfire Behavior. As you know, droughts and wildfire have become frequent in recent years. These natural disasters lead to immeasurable social and economic consequences. The drought-associated forest disturbances are expected to increase with climate change, which in turn will also impact wildfires. And as you know, behavior of wildfires, it refers to the way it burns, how quickly it spreads, and how much vegetation it consumes. We have an expert group of panelists with uh, us today to discuss about these issues and more. I have suggested each of the panelists to make short remarks, maybe take around six minutes or so, so that we save ample time to discuss about some of the questions. Uh, and I'm requesting the audience to send their questions through the Q&A um, option of Zoom. And we will follow through with uh, whatever number of questions we can go through. And uh, the rest of the questions will be answered online later. So with that, let me introduce uh, our first panelist, 
Dr. Crystal Colden is an assistant professor of fire science in the management of complex systems department at UC Merced. She is a former wildland firefighter and conduct and applied research for the US Forest Service and US Geological Survey in California, as well as Alaska. She works with communities and stakeholders to develop plans for reducing wildfire risk. Uh, Crystal? Thank you so much, Prasant. Uh, and thank you so much to uh, Professor Maldonado for asking me to join uh, team here today. Um, as, as I was introduced, uh, I have a pretty unique background uh, in fire uh, as a firefighter and working for land management agencies uh, before I came to academia um, previously at the University of Idaho and, and now at UC Merced. Uh, but because I do so much of this work uh, with communities working on wildfire planning, uh, my questions and the research I do are really driven by that. And so my focus is on how fire science can actually inform mitigation of wildfire disasters and, and how can we integrate the science that all of my colleagues have been presenting today to address wildfire vulnerability. Next slide, please. So the first thing that I want to try and convince you is that we humans uh, are not simply passive actors uh, in this uh, event where we're waiting with our go bags by the door for an evacuation notification. Um, and the reality is that we humans have successfully mitigated nearly every natural hazard we face uh, through our incredible ingenuity, and we can do so for wildfire as well. The first step is understanding that not all wildfire is bad, and several of my colleagues have noted this. Um, it is not Armageddon, even though it may feel like it sometimes, uh, but if we can better connect fires, uh, like so many of my colleagues have talked about, to how they actually impact humans in specific ways, we can actively work to minimize those worst impacts. Uh, fires are really critical and necessary ecosystem process in California, as my colleagues have noted. Uh, we cannot, nor should we, try to exterminate fire from our state. We tried to do it in the 20th century and it actually contributed to the forest health crisis that we are experiencing today that contributes to those disastrous megafires. Um, and if you honestly believe still that we can stop all wildfires, uh, I have a bridge to sell you. Uh, so natural hazard science is a great place where we can draw from on this. And it tells us that our goal must actually be mitigation and adaptation, including both conducting the applied science needed to achieve this goal and facilitating a California where beneficial fire can do the critical ecological work it has done for millennia while we humans face minimal damages. Uh, my work specifically asks, how do we manage complex landscapes and coordinate mitigation activities that minimize those disastrous wildfire outcomes while enabling that beneficial fire? Next slide, please. So disasters by definition are catastrophic events for humans, right? Uh, we are the ones that define what disasters are. Um, and they're happening because we fail to adapt and mitigate negative fire impacts to our communities, particularly in that wildland urban interface that we, we're very good at predicting uh, where fires will get big and destructive. So much of the work this morning demonstrated how far we have come in those models. But that science of prediction is really useless without the social science and engineering that will help us change human behaviors and infrastructure so we can become resilient. A great example of this in the UC system is actually with earthquakes uh, because the UC has long been a leader uh, in earthquake engineering science. And after the 1906 San Francisco quake, we didn't just sit back and wait for the next big one. Uh, we did science and without the trifecta of modern engineering science, uh, building codes and policy and the social science to inform public education outreach, the 1989 Loma Prieta quake in the Bay Area potentially could have killed over 60,000 people instead of just 63. Um, and you may wonder how education and science are important in this and, and ask yourself, what do you know about the words stop, drop and roll? 
education and the science that informs that education is really critical uh, to changing human behavior. So my work focuses on how we can identify success stories related to wildfire and learn from them and apply those approaches elsewhere. Uh, and one of the studies that I, I came out with recently in 2017, we looked at the town of Montecito after the 2017 Thomas fire. And we found that Montecito emerged from that fire relatively excuse me, relatively unscathed uh, because of community partnerships that were formed to co uh, coordinate critical mitigation activities. Um, and that study is now being used by other communities around the world to try and uh, mimic what was done in Montecito, but in a place-based way. So similarly, uh, we've been using that study and others to inform a framework to understand what a truly fire adapted landscape looks like from the mountaintop to the urban center um, and identify what the barriers of implementation are across that gradient. Next slide, please. Finally, it's important to point out, as several of my colleagues have, that wildfire disasters are environmental justice issues. Uh, they are not just something that happens to everyone equally, right? Uh, it is easy for us as UC faculty, many of us making six figures, uh, that we can just tell everyone, oh, you need to harden your homes or everybody needs to invest in doing certain types of things around their communities. Uh, where I live in Tuolumne County, the vast majority of my rural neighbors here live here because they can't afford to live anywhere else. And they certainly don't have the funds to try and harden their homes or replace their roofs even. Um, that's an expensive proposition for them. Uh, so instead, what can we do? Oops. Uh, natural disasters are well known to disproportionately impact vulnerable populations, including people of color, indigenous communities, migrants, children, and the elderly. For example, in the 2018 campfire, over 80% of the 85 fatalities were people over 65 years old. In 2020, when fires blanketed nearly the entire state of California in hazardous smoke for weeks on end, migrant farm workers were still working tirelessly in that haze to pick the crops that drive our state's agricultural economy. Indigenous people who have been mentioned today uh, on, on whose homelands the UC system resides, they were once consummate fire stewards shaping this state and its ecosystems uh, rather than fighting fires. They used it as a tool. And today they have a very limited ability to burn and it threatens their culture and their lives. And we cannot ignore the social justice framework in our research as it only serves to further exacerbate those inequalities that pervade our state and our country. So in order to best mitigate wildfire impacts to those most vulnerable populations, we need to know where they are and what mitigation strategies successfully reduce their vulnerability. And this is why I'm leading a team of city planning researchers from Berkeley and UCLA, uh, researching where our most marginalized communities are that are also highly vulnerable to wildfire impacts so that we can identify the gaps in information and resources and prioritize disaster mitigation in those communities. As my colleagues have noted, uh, there is a need for increased collaboration and in interdisciplinary research. For example, we know that most wildfire fatalities happen during evacuation. When people don't know where the wildfire is, they don't know where to go and they panic. Uh, and one potential capability of that alert wildfire system that Neil described and showed us this morning uh, is to actually potentially drive a real-time public information uh, smartphone app that helps fleeing residents evacuate quickly and to the nearest safe place uh, based on rapidly changing fire conditions. But in order to be able to build something like that, we need transportation and cognitive sciences to help do the science to inform that kind of product to make it effective and save lives. Uh, so my other three colleagues in this panel are going to focus more on drought and fire impacts uh, to forests, which is such a big piece of the puzzle. And it's so important to understand how these fires work across landscapes. And I hope that as you listen to them, you'll think about the next step and about how those fires then move to communities and how we can actually mitigate that fire before it becomes a disaster. Thank you. 
Thank you, Crystal. Um, I'm glad that you brought up the issues of environmental justice and uh, the impact of uh, indigenous culture, both very important aspects. Hopefully we'll get to hear more about um, those issues during the Q&A. Let me move on to introducing our second panelist. Uh, Dr. Andrew Latimer is a professor in the Department of Plant Sciences at UC Davis. He also serves as the faculty director of the Natural Reserve System. Andrew studies effects of climate change and disturbances on California's plant communities. Over to you, Andrew. Thanks, Prasant. Yeah, great to be here. I really appreciate being part of this panel, um, talking about things that, um, yeah, vital to the state and really interesting to me personally. Um, and Crystal, I, I, yeah, this is a great setup because um, these, the way that what's I think really was always true, but really became impossible to ignore in 2020 was the way that we interact with lands kind of in the back country remotely um, or remote for many of us, you know, me sitting here in Davis um, is not really remote. It has these direct impacts on us as wildfires erupt. Well, they have effects on the people who are picking the food that then we go and buy and eat and have effects on other people, you know, living in homes that get destroyed, other communities that are recipients of the people fleeing those homes or needing to move, um, and housing prices kind of playing all into this as well. So yeah, really complex. And as Crystal said, I'm going to kind of step a little more back into the kind of the forest context, but that's really important to keep in mind. So let me um, just share my screen here and um, bring up this little talk. And so yeah, um, as as we've heard, so I mean, this this topic is drought and forest. We've just gone through a major drought, a really extreme one that's by historical standards was extreme, but is also really kind of instructive for us because it's probably more like what we'll see more of in the next century and perhaps beyond. Um, a drought that was associated with mortality of well over 100 million trees. Here's a little snapshot in the Yosemite. The year after when some of the same, probably climate scientists say, some of the same dynamics can also lead to really wet years. So we had you know, spectacular waterfalls occurring here the year after the drought ended. Um, and then wildfire is right, as Crystal said, impacting us in lots of ways. Here's just a couple of pictures from the natural reserve system near UC Davis. Some of our reserves, including one of the director's houses was not hardened against fire and it, it, it uh, was destroyed. Whereas the field station, which was built kind of in a modern way, was hardened, same same hillside, but but survived. So just a little anecdote. Um, uh, yeah. So what we have is more frequent fire, and then also fire interacting with droughts. And so this brings up this really important issue for us and for climate thinking about climate change impacts on forests and other other ecosystems in the future is compounding disturbances, one way to think about it. So when one disturbance happens, a fire happens, it changes the fuels. It may limit future fire or it may stimulate growth of plants that then fuel a future fire. Drought can also change the fuel loads that then affect um, fire in complex ways. And it's really, this is, uh, I think, an exciting research frontier that we're trying to work on in the UC. And um, one of the ways, the way that I tend to approach it is to just keep this in mind that the fuel that fires are burning is plants and um, except in the wooey where sometimes it's houses too but what I'm looking at is mostly systems where it's plants dead parts of plants and then also sometimes live parts of plants and so thinking about how disturbances affect then the next disturbance that happens is really thinking about how do the plants respond how do the trees respond shrubs grasses the dead parts the live parts um, so these kind of interacting disturbances um, where we have drought occurring and then having an impact on fire, there's been increasing research to show that that is a major impact. Um, that basically when you have drought killing a lot of trees, the needles fall to the ground, branches fall to the ground, you have a big pulse of fuels. And then if a fire comes through, especially in a hot, dry year, you can have really intense fire. And here's an example of potentially one of these cases, or two of these cases really, of a couple of recent fires that burn through giant sequoia groves and killed the number of trees, dozens of trees that had survived for thousands of years and you know hundreds of fires before and yet were killed this time. And so why it appears that this kind of compounding disturbances 
is uh, the cause. So in studying this, I'm just going to give you a couple, talk about a couple of research initiatives that, that we're working on at UC Davis. One of them focuses on this fact that most of the trees killed during the recent drought were di the direct cause of death was bark beetle attack. So bark beetles are herbivores that burrow in and eat the tissue on the inside of the bark and then girdle the tree, kill it. Um, and but how exactly they, um, what exactly, you know, causes, increases the risk of death or increases forest vulnerability to this, these outbreaks is, um, you know, is a, is a work in progress. Um, there's a lot known, but there's a lot we don't. So the Forest Service was doing this great, a uh, team of people led by Chris Fettig, an etymologist, was doing a great survey of bark beetle outbreaks during the recent drought. But because it takes a long time to walk around, measure trees, hatch it into them and see what killed them, map them, um, they could only reach a certain number of trees. And my grad student, Mike Kuntz, realized as he was trying to do this himself, that wow, we could do this a lot faster if we use drones and machine learning to kind of map the trees instead. And so he did that. And this has actually turned out to a really cool data set. Um, just one person, him, after he trained himself, um, with funding from the Forest Service and NSF and CAL FIRE was able to go and survey about almost half a million trees just in one summer, himself and his drone. Um, there he is with his partner. Um, so she came along too sometimes. So one, one or two people <laughs> for a summer when she wasn't doing her own research. Um, so anyway, yeah, this huge data set, kind of amazing number of trees that could be mapped and then identified really carefully and accurately to live or dead status through a bunch of processing. We take the photos from the drone, run them through um, software pipelines to generate these 3D models of the forest and then map the trees and assess them as live or dead and which species they are. So that's really cool. I think this is a really valuable um, tool that we can use going forward to understand changes in forests. But I wanna say the lesson, you know, so what did we actually get out of doing this, uh, measuring all these trees from the air and the ground was, pretty striking actually. And, and I have to admit it was somewhat surprising to me, maybe it shouldn't have been, but it was, is that the big factor, the biggest single factor affecting the probability that a tree, a host tree that can be attacked by bark beetles, which is basically a pine tree, um, the chance it'll get attacked and die in an outbreak during a drought is really strongly re uh, related to what's the proportion of other susceptible host trees around. So it's a lot like pandemic in a way. It's like how many trees are susceptible to bark beetles in an area. If there are a lot of them, that is really ponderosa pine and other pine species, then each individual pine has a larger uh, chance of death. So I think you know the lesson from this and some other field work that kind of tells the same story is that we really should be not planting um, low diversity plantations, which has been actually created quite a few of the forests that were killed in this outbreak. Instead, we should be amping up the diversity. Although it's, you know, it's complicated. It's not a simple prescription. We don't really have it yet. Um, and the last thing I'll just say is that the other research initiative I'm really working on is what to do after a big fire comes through and kills off a lot of the trees. The public land owners, at least, don't really have the capacity to plant very much of this, maybe 5% of the severely burned area, something like that. So it becomes really important to pick where to plant it. Um, and so we're doing research just to monitor how things work, and then also, again, use drones and artificial intelligence to map surviving trees and predict seed rain and predict where seedlings will come up. So um, that's, thanks. I'll wrap up there. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I, I like your theme of resiliency, you know, building resiliency for the um, forest as well as the ecosystem. But, you know, I would have never thought that bark beetles play such a big role in forest fires. And uh, uh, that, that also shows how complex the ecosystem is and um, what all we need to look at in order to address the challenges. So hopefully we'll talk more about this uh, a few minutes later. Let me introduce our third panelist. Uh, Dr. Lara Kupers is an associate professor in the Energy and Resources Group at UC Berkeley and a faculty scientist at the Berkeley Lab. She is an interdisciplinary environmental scientist and uses field experiments and observations to understand the climate ecosystem interactions with the current focus on Western US and tropical forest. Lara? 
Thank you so much, Prasad. I appreciate the opportunity also uh, to be speaking in the symposium today. Um, I hope my uh, slides are coming through all right. Yep. Great. So um, my group uh, pursues both basic and applied research aimed at projecting the coupled future of climate, ecosystems, and wildfire. And we're working with a number of collaborators and with support from the UC, the Department of Energy, and CAL FIRE on a number of interlinked projects. So past, as it has been said already uh, by a number of speakers, past forest and fire management in many parts of the state has left current forests with excess fuels, that is, combustible vegetation amounts that are inconsistent with the fire regimes we had uh, prior to the 20th century. At the same time, climate change, which has been lengthening the dry season and drying out these fuels more rapidly each summer, has made the situation increasingly dangerous for both people and for nature. And so these two drivers of wildfire risk, both the vegetation and the climate, really need to be considered together in any integrated approach to the problem. Climate, uh, particularly temperature and water balance, as we've heard, vegetation dynamics and wildfire are really inextricably linked in California. And climate change is pushing the system into new territory. So while our current predicament, as we've been hearing, is really quite clear, it's much harder to see where we're headed in the longer term. And I would argue that our best crystal balls, if you will, for seeing decades into the future are rigorously tested process-based simulation models that can allow us to visualize multiple California ecosystem futures based on scenarios. And so in a collaboration with scientists from multiple UCs and UC run national laboratories, we're developing and testing the capability to simulate forest responses to drought, wildfire, and forest health treatments uh, at the level of the state as a whole. And we're doing this in a framework that is directly coupled to climate models, simulating carbon and water fluxes with the atmosphere, as well as the effects of wildfire and drought on California's ecosystems. So as a first example, uh, we're using an approach grounded in physics and tree physiology to reproduce data revealing how the prolonged drought stress um, just a few years ago can stress even deep rooted trees, forcing them to dramatically reduce the amount of water that they use. This reduction in water use, which is shown in this panel on the right, over the course of the drought means a reduction in growth and also a reduction in the defenses that trees have available to use against beetle attack. And together, these both uh, increase the risk of tree mortality. Our simulations also can capture the reductions in stream flow that are associated uh, with the drought itself and the redu reduced uh, soil moisture capacity. We're also working to simulate how future warming reduces the moisture content of live chaparral vegetation uh, which increases the average number of days with high fire risk. So in this image here, you can see chemise, which is a, a plant species that is common in chaparral shrublands uh, that is widespread throughout the state and is widely used as an indicator of fire risk in these ecosystems. The temperature driven increase that we see into the future in our simulation model is offset only partially by increases in atmospheric CO2, uh, which will tend to help plants conserve water. Um, and so as you can see, really the, the temperature effect um, due to warming is really overriding any benefit that the plants might achieve from increases in carbon dioxide. And using a coupled representation of forests and fire, we're also able to simulate how the proportion of fire resistant pines in the mixed conifer forest of the Sierra Nevada would change. The fire is fully suppressed versus restored to burn primarily on the ground as we've been hearing about. We're testing predictions of tree growth and mortality and predictions of fire behavior 
to alternate forest health treatments, including thinning and prescribed fire to reduce fuels. And this, um, these, this model framework that's been tested against uh, observational data is allowing us to probe both past and future states of the forest and of fire with alternate scenarios of forest management and rapidly changing climate and carbon dioxide concentrations. We're also actively working to develop the capability to simulate bark beetle dynamics and some of the effects that Andrew was just, was just talking about in terms of the preferential survival of individual trees and the role of the density of the hosts in the um, mortality that follows. So together, this integrated simulation framework, we believe will help us anticipate how vegetation and fire management pursued now on our landscapes will sh shape California's future ecosystems and future fire risk decades into the future. An urgent question facing land managers and policymakers is how we should manage today's landscapes for the future while protecting biodiversity, limiting damage to people's health and livelihoods and addressing our urgent climate crisis. So ecosystems are already changing as the climate rapidly pushes them in new directions. Ecologically and physically robust process-based models like the ones I've been talking about can help us see both the risks as well as the opportunities for enhancing climate resilience in our landscape. A coordinated long-term research and policy strategy to address climate and wildfire and its in impacts is also needed to move forward in the state. And we see a need for sustained efforts to rapidly incorporate new scientific insights into on the ground decision support. And this is an effort that we're eager to help with um, and apply our modeling tools uh, to. So thanks so much. And I look forward to questions when we get to them. Thanks, Lara. Um, it's, it's important to realize how important uh, water and moisture related to this entire uh, complex situation. Uh, it's kind of thinking if you can make fire resistance pines, maybe we should make fire resistant forest completely. Um, but I see uh, questions popping up related to your talk, but let's hold on to the questions and um, move on to the fourth panelist. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing Safiq Khan, who is a cooperative extension specialist in water and watershed sciences at University of California Division of Agriculture and Natural Resources. He is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at UC Merced. Safiq's research broadly focuses on understanding interaction between climate and terrestrial ecosystem in the Earth's critical zone. Safiq? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Mapatra, for that great introduction. And thank you, Dr. Malinado, for having me on this event. Um, and thank you to all of, of, all of our viewers for sticking all the way to the end. And this is, I think I'm the last presenter in, in, in this um, symposium. So I really appreciate you sticking all the way uh, during this four hours long Zoom meeting. My presentation will largely focus on adaptive solutions and things that we can do on the ground to minimize the effect of, um, effect of tree mortality and, and, and wildfire. And I would like to remind myself and remind all of our viewers the great benefit and value uh, that our forested watersheds provide, what are some of the emerging threats that they are facing, and some of the science and innovation that, that my group is leading in terms of increasing the watershed resilience and, and building some of the decision support tools that can help prioritize investment. Okay, so um, as you all probably know that our forested watersheds are the single largest source of water in the United States and California is no exception. And in talking in terms of some of the numbers, you know, California's national forest provide alone, you know, 50% uh, of the state's water supply that is estimated to be somewhere around nine and a half billion annually. Um, it not only supports the 39 million Californians, but also supports the, the nation's top agricultural industry, um, providing you know, um, majority of the, 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 the vegetables and, and nuts and, and all other uh, commodities. 
Unfortunately, today our watersheds lack resilience to extreme weather events that exacerbate drought as well as wildfire. As far as the, the recent estimate from the US Forest Service, on average in the past decade, we have about 400,000 acres that, uh, that burn annually, which is approximately five-fold increase compared to the mid uh, 20th century. And the setting, the backdrop to this, this wildfire drought um, nexus is really the, the climate that has equipped California to be this agriculture powerhouse that, that we are today. We have this bi-seasonal climate, which is also known as Mediterranean climate, where we get a lot of our precipitation during these winter months, um, primarily between December to, to March and, and April. But then we have this long dry season during which the, much of our vegetation actually grows, but we don't really get much precipitation you know, uh, if at, at all. And, and it, this really creates a problem for our natural vegetation where we do not have the, the luxury of irrigation. And, and they have to rely on, on the water storage, the water that is stored in the subsurface. And oftentimes that storage is not enough that causes this seasonal drought that the vegetation has to go through year after year. Luckily in California, we are blessed to have our snowpack, our mountain snowpack that helps us reduce this, this drought deficit in the summer. And, and this, this presence or absence of the snowpack really drives whether we have a shorter wildfire season or a longer wildfire season. We have a drier fuel or wetter fuel. It's largely driven by this snowpack. And as, as you all have heard throughout this morning, as well as in the previous talks, you know, um, that our snowpack is disappearing. So although, you know, climatologically speaking, our precipitation variability has not changed much in the last hundred years. We are still within the range of variation that is expected. What has changed is really the snowpack causing this, what we describe as a snow drought, primarily fueled by the warmer temperature as some of my earlier colleagues have pointed out. We are losing our snowpack in much of this mid elevation area that was actually supplying the critical water supply to our natural ecosystem. And there is a direct link between losing the snowpack in this mid elevation area and drought related tree mortality in the, in the forest. We have also seen that our reservoirs, thinking in terms of the downstream, downstream implication of this loss of snowpack, our reservoirs are not filling as often as they used to in the past. As you can see, this is the average reservoir storage in the top uh, five reservoirs in the Sacramento River Basin. As you can see, our reservoirs are not filling that often. And even when they are filling, they are not filling to their full capacity. That is in part driven by the complexities that, that is actually coming with the changing snowpack regime and a snow drought. There are, there are really, um, they're not only affecting our source watershed, but they're also affecting the watersheds downstream. As you can see, you know, this classic picture that you have probably have seen some variation of this picture that documents the ground subsidence in the, in the Central Valley. So besides changing the snowpack, as, as some of our, you know, my colleagues have alluded, um, that our years of fire suppression has led to this overgrown dense forest. Here is a one picture from the Tahoe National Forest near the French Meadows area that is close to the Lake Tahoe. What you're seeing here on the left is a managed forest owned by you know, um, you know, a private um, NGO. And on the right, you have a you know, forest managed by the US Forest Service. And you can clearly see the contrast. And there is a recent study from you know, McIntyre et al. that actually documented looking at the historical um, the vegetation survey plots and they compared the change in the tree density and, and basal area. And they have documented the significant increase in number of smaller trees in our forested landscape. And you are, this is not a rocket science, you all probably know more trees equal to more straws in the ground, which means less water that is available for everyone, for the ecosystem as well as for downstream users, which when it's, the water is not available, it creates more fuel that often you know, fuels the large and massive wildfire. So what, is, what are the solutions? What can we do about it? One of the solutions that my group is working through collaboration with multiple you know, faculties throughout the UC system is developing collaborative science and tool to help change the pace and scale of 
uh, forest management, uh, which basically means that reducing the biomass density. We are using a range of tools from, you know, thinning of the, the smaller trees, uh, mastication, as well as prescribed burning to bring the forest back to a sustainable condition. And this is one snapshot. This is one project that I am part of, which is the French, French Meadows project. It's a 12,000 acre, you know, restoration project right across the Lake Tahoe. And this is a picture um, during our last you know, field visit where we showcased some of the work that was doing because building the public trust and building the collaborative is really the key in doing some of these work on the, on the ground because there's a lot of baggage. There's a lot of baggage that we have to overcome as a, as a scientist, as well as people who are trying to implement these projects. So to make sure that the, the, the people are, are on board with whatever work that we do on the landscape. And to count some of the benefits that is coming out of these projects, you know, we can reduce the fire risk, we can reduce, build the drought resiliency, we can improve water quality, we can possibly put more water into the system and sequester more carbon. In doing so, we can create jobs, we can create sustainable, you know, um, we can create sustainable and renewable energy that can help offset the cost. And this project, if some of you, you may be familiar, was actually initiated and got triggered by the 2014 King Fire, where the PCWA that manages a couple of the reservoirs downstream got filled with sedimentation and debris flow, and they are still paying the cost. They're still paying the cost. So there is clear urgency to help minimize the, the, the effect of wildfire that actually follows um, and be more proactive than, than reactive. We also need to actually quantify the benefits because I forgot who was, was talking about the actual cost of restoration. We are estimating about $1,000 to $1,400 per acre that will actually cost to do the, the thinning and prescribed burning. It's a very expensive enterprise. So who is going to pay for this? You know, state government is, doesn't have the money. Federal government doesn't have the money. We really need to quantify the benefits and be able to monetize those benefits. We need to quantify the benefits and show the, the, the stakeholders that you are getting something in return of your investment. And in order to, to do that, we really need to understand the, 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 the hydrology. We need to understand the, the carbon cycle. We need to understand the fuel you know, uh, regime and the fire regime. And those are, this is probably one diagram that keeps coming in all the talks that these processes are interlinked and they're very complex. And we really need sophisticated ground measurements. We need sophisticated modeling tools that can help us tease apart and be able to put some numbers on the ground that we can actually help um, you know, use both for the communication as well as um, you know, building the, the, the investment that's needed. And here's one example of, of some of the work that, that I have, I have, I'm, I'm doing, you know, taking the ground measurement, putting that into a modeling framework and be able to quantify how much stream flow gain in this case, for example, you're going to get from that investment that you're making. And this is in response to a 50% biomass reduction. And as you can see, you know, we can put more water in the stream, you know, anywhere between zero to you know, close to 200 millimeter of additional water. But as you, as you can also you know, see that those benefits depend highly on whether you are getting a wet year or dry year. During a dry year, you're not really putting more water into the stream, but rather a lot of that water saved by the, by the removing you know, trees actually goes back to the remaining trees that are there so they can build more drought resilience, right? So it's a trade-off. You're not gonna get both benefits at the same time. You know, during the drought, maybe the remaining trees will benefit, but in a wet year or normal year, you might be able to achieve both goals. Is the drought resilience same everywhere? Probably not. You know, we need a very tailored prescription. Some landscapes will build drought resilience, other landscapes will not. So we need very prescriptive, prescriptive um, you know, implementation of these projects just to make sure that we are not doing harm. In some cases, what we find here is that if you open up the canopy, it will actually make that forest more susceptible to drought because the hydrology, you messed up the hydrology. So the snow is no longer you know, um, there, it starts melting faster. So you have to make sure that you actually account for the hydrologic differences in the landscape, look at the fuel loading, look at the fire regime and put all of those things together. I think that's the general theme that you continue to hear throughout this morning. And as my colleague Laura Cooper mentioned that this is really, you know, we can't just prepare our watersheds for today. We have to think in terms of the future and we do not have a crystal ball. What we have the, is, is these well-trained, well-calibrated you know, models that we can use to understand what the future of these watersheds is gonna look like. 
And here is one example where we're looking at different combination of climate warming, different combination of atmospheric CO2 and how they interact and trying to predict whether we will have more vegetative biomass in the future or not. And as you can see in the lower elevation, the result is not that clear. It really depends where you start, whether you start with the you know, higher CO2 or higher warming. But at the higher elevation, the signal is very clear that we are going to have much more dense forest moving into the future. So make, we have to make sure that whatever prescription we are designing today is reflective of the forest in the future. And these models are a great tool to help you know, um, achieve that goal. As per the for US Forest Service estimate, there are about like six to eight million acres of forest land that requires immediate treatment. And if you do the math, you know, by thousand to fourteen hundred dollars per acre, that's you know six, nine to ten billion dollars, right? That's a lot of money that you need to do the restoration. The bottom line is that you cannot do the treatment everywhere at the required pace and scale. So what can we do? We really need to prioritize and identify the areas that will require the immediate attention and be able to quantify the benefit and track those benefits over time. So we started this project, the state funded project, where we are trying to put together a data layer, a system of data layer that quantifies all the different assets and ecosystem services coming out of the forest, analyze their current condition, analyze what is their potential, you know, how much carbon they can sequester, how much water they can produce, right? And then combine those with the risk what is the climate risk going into the future? And then provide a tool to the managers, to the funding agencies, so they can prioritize depending what their you know, agency goal is and be able to allocate funding and, and keep track the return on those on those investments. So if you so can that, have I will stop and happy to enter in questions. Okay. And done, thank you. Thanks, thanks, Safiq. Uh, I like the way you presented solutions also in, in addition to identifying the challenges. Can I invite all the panelists onto the screen? And we are missing Andrew, okay. Okay, so uh, we have uh, quite a few questions. We may not have time for all the questions, but let me uh, pick up, you know, I'll, I'll try to tweak a little bit to add controversies and feel free to disagree with each other. Um, so picking up from Safiq's uh, remarks, uh, maybe, you know, Crystal, uh, also uh, mentioned about this, about forest health, okay? So here is my question. Since forest health is a big component in fire problem, how come we can't just log our way out of it? Uh, why there is so much resistance to forest thinning? Well, I think that Safiq really hit on, on the one of the key problems, which is that it's expensive to do this work. And our history of trying to address it has been to uh, try and make it um, economically profitable to go in and do a lot of this. Um, and Glenda talked about this in her discussion about biomass as well, right? Um, but the reality is that the material that needs to be removed the most is not profitable material. In the current framework we have, it's not profitable. So the past practices have been to try and incentivize uh, contractors to come in and do a lot of this work um, by including the types of trees that we actually want to have stay in the forest, right? Um, our bigger trees that are more profitable. So moving forward, um, we can use and must use thinning as a critical tool, but we have to look at this as an investment, as Safiq noted, where we've got the state recognizing that more of this money has to be allocated as an investment against wildfire disasters and the costs of suppression and cleanup, rather than trying to actually make the logging and thinning treatments themselves profitable. Um, and that's really the key distinction there, I think. Thank you. And let me throw it back to Safiq with another controversial question. Why should the Californians who live in the valley and urban areas care about the status of our forests? Yeah, and I think I, I try to touch upon that issue, right? Because yes, you know, these wildlands are somewhat segregated from, you know, where we live, but these are all connected. I mean, during the past drought and the years that have followed, if one thing that we have learned is that, that we are all in this together, right? We cannot escape the smoke. We have to rely on the, on the clean water that is coming from the Sierra, right? 
So we are all benefiting from the same system. And maybe in the past, we were not realizing it, but as these wildfire threats continue to intensify, we are going to experience, you know, we will have those, you know, smoky days and perhaps, you know, shutting down of businesses and, and all the other things. So it's not a, you know, rural versus urban issue. I think it's a California issue. And I would probably say this is a national issue. It's, a, it's not, you know, specific you. to California. Thank you, Safiq. Uh, Lara, there is a question from Adi and specifically for you. In many Californian ecosystem, the types, moisture level and density of vegetations are often different between the upland versus the riparian zones. Can you discuss how the riparian zones are integrated into the fire modeling and the management, particularly mm -hmm. during the drought? Yeah. Well, I think, um, you know, as the, uh, the landscape of California is quite diverse, uh, we have these diverse ecosystems that occur in, in different parts of the um, in different parts of the landscape. So the forests, for example, uh, that have access to more water closer to the riparian zones are often um, in, a, in a normal year more buffered from dry conditions, uh, whereas the upland ecosystems often have um, you know, more dramatic swings in their access to water over the course of the season. And so one um, real challenge here is understanding what's happening in the subsurface as we enter periods of extended drought and the water supply for all forests drops below what they're well adapted to. And so I think there are some outstanding uh, research questions to resolve related to you know, how much um, of that subsurface water capacity can be sustained uh, during these prolonged droughts in the riparian areas versus um, how much of it essentially um, gets too deep below the rooting zone for the plants that are used to having access to shallower water in riparian zones. So I think there's some interesting um, lessons to learn from the drought that we had just a few years ago in terms of, um, of these questions. And we're working to improve the way models represent uh, these differential access to subsurface water uh, to be better able to capture um, the real diversity of effects that drought can have in just a single landscape. Thanks, Lara. So um, let me bring up this very interesting question and uh, Andrew, you can take this on or actually any of you can answer this. What do you think are the major unknowns about how drought will affect the California forests? Yeah, I think one of the one of the big questions is is um, by the long term effect of the changes in the fuels from a large um, tree mortality event, and there's, um, I mean, there, so a couple of years ago there was a paper that came out. Some I think the authors are mainly from Berkeley talking about kind of warning that there's potential for real bad effects when the large parts of the trees that were killed start falling and creating log piles on the, on the ground. My reaction to that was initially, no, that sounds wrong because um, surface fire models really concentrate on fine fuels. You know, you, you walk around a forest that's been burned, the logs aren't gone, you know, they don't generally get consumed. So they're not really, was my understanding, they don't really contribute to that. But I've actually been starting to change my, or at least be open to the idea that maybe that's wrong. Now, I'm wrong and that it, this is a big problem because it seemed like in the Creek fire in 2020, um, just the presence of those heavy fuels um, was kind of creating more heat across a larger area of the footprint and driving this like emergent plume behavior, like a plume of air going up and sucking in more wind from the side and fueling more intense fire behavior. So I feel like the, the link between drought effects on fuels and then intense fire behavior is a big one. I'm sure other people have other ideas though. Yeah, and I, I just wanna, I just wanna add that you know, I mean, trying to set up these models and trying to simulate, you know, what the, the future forest might look like. I think one of the issues that we are battling with that we really don't know much about the subsurface, right? You know, how much water is stored there and for how long these trees can go on, you know, with, with the drought, right? In some places, they have like about a year of storage and some places they might have a couple of years of storage, but literally we cannot put our finger in terms of, what's that threshold, right? At what point these trees will start showing the, the sign of the stress and beetles and some of the other you know, disturbance will start taking over. 
And I think there is very little knowledge in terms of the subsurface as, as far as I'm concerned. Okay, so um, the next question I'm picking from the Q&A box, and this is for all of you. And if you could, uh, since we have only a couple more minutes, if you could be brief in your remark. Are you optimistic about our ability to reduce wildfires and associated impacts in California and more broadly? Who wants to go? So first? I can start. Yeah. Uh, so, so as so many of us have noted, we do not want to actually reduce wildfires. We want to reduce wildfire disasters. We need fire. We've always had fire. We're going to continue having fire. What we want is to have fire that it burns without having all of these massive negative impacts to our critical ecosystem services and to our communities. And I'm optimistic because we've done it for every other major natural disaster in the US. Uh, and we have incredible ingenuity. We have incredible re research ingenuity right here in the UC system. I think we can do it. And it's a matter of committing and working with the state and stakeholders to move that forward. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah, that is spot on. yeah, sorry. I was gonna say that is spot on, Crystal. Yeah, we don't wanna stop wildfires. We are actually trying to bring wildfire back to the system. I think, you know, if we can manage and mitigate the negative consequences, um, I think that should be our goal. Go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, optimistic because I think there, compared to 10 years ago, there's a lot of positive change in use of fire with that and state funding, federal, fund, well, maybe federal funding for these things and research. And so I think, and just attitudes and the ability kind of, uh, I think kind of the democratizing of fire a little bit more is starting to happen so that it's going back into the hands of people, not just in a few agencies. And that, that's a really positive thing, so. And Lara? Uh, I think um, another um, really positive development that I'm seeing and encouraged by is um, the expanded collaboration and coordination among uh, researchers and practitioners across the state to try and um, accelerate the way in which the discoveries that we make in our research can be utilized, not just by, um, you know, like a single policymaker or a single um, agency, but also um, at all levels of government. And so, and, and you know, by uh, the private sector as well. So I think that's a real opportunity that needs to be expanded on. Thank you, thank you. And there are many more questions, but we are out of time. I take this opportunity to thank all the panelists. Uh, this was uh, such an exciting discussion. Uh, I would like to hand it back to Teresa. Great, thank you, Prasant. Thank you, panelists, inspiring. Eager to follow up with you later. So as I'm providing very, very brief closing remarks, there's a second poll um, for the audience. Um, so Beth, could you pull it up and I will speak at the same time. Thank you. I'll let you read the question real quickly for a few seconds and I'll start to, um, it's a multiple choice question. But uh, I'm grateful to all the presenters today and to our audience for participating. We at the University of California system hope we can provide value we do want to make a difference, and I think you heard the passion from our researchers today. We heard how complex wildfires are with large-scale coupled systems, cascading disasters, extreme weather events, and fires creating their own weather patterns. And most importantly, the disproportionate impact on our diverse populations in California. Our second UC wildfire symposium will be held on Wednesday morning, July 28th. We will send out a hold the date next week and post it on our website. We will cover other themes as the wildland urban interface, hydrology, human health, and social and economic justice issues. Our third symposium will be at a date to be determined in August. And to the faculty in the audience, I am eager to meet with you let me know if you would like to be part of the planning for these future events. And finally, to the audience, if you think of follow-on questions, please email them to us. We, we will continuously be open to your thoughts after the event as you ponder the presentations you have heard today. Thank you for participating in our first symposium 
and have a great day, everyone.